Greetings from just outside of Boston, Massachusetts, and welcome to Disruption 2020. Our sponsors for today's event are Get Abstract and MIT Sloan Executive Education. I'm Paul Michaelman, Editor-in-Chief of MIT Sloan Management Review, and I'm delighted to be joined by my co-host for today's event, Karen Dillon. Karen has worn several hats during her highly distinguished career, including editor of Harvard Business Review Magazine, and co-author of three books with the late Clayton Christensen, including How Will You Measure Your Life and The Prosperity Paradox. Karen was the guest editor of the special spring issue of Sloan Management Review, dedicated to the present and future of disruption. Welcome, Karen. Thanks, Paul. Glad to be here today. I just wanted to say we started working on this special issue nearly a year ago, a year ago this coming summer, when the world looked very different than it did today. Uh, perhaps most significantly was the fact that Clay was alive, and, and though he was struggling with some health issues, he was very excited about the idea of asking some of the world-class thinkers we published in this issue to think about the concept of disruption to Sloan Management Review. His theory of disruptive innovation was originally published more than two decades ago, and even Clay would have told you it's evolved a lot since then. The basic idea for this issue was, what do we know now about disruption, strategy, and people resources that can help guide companies for the next two decades? That's the question we pose to the speakers who will join us today. Thanks, Karen. Okay, here's how the next several hours will go. Each of our speakers will join us for about 30 minutes to discuss the key findings and takeaways from their most recent work on disruption, with special attention paid to their work's relevance to these extremely disruptive times. Karen and I will trade off hosting each conversation. We welcome your questions for our panelists. To submit questions, please enter them anytime in the questions module on the GoToWebinar control panel. We'll answer as many questions as time permits. To view captions for the event, use the link sloanreview.mit.edu slash disruption dash captions. For caption support or tech issues, call 800-590-4203. If you encounter audio or other difficulties during today's program, please follow the instructions in the questions module. About a week after the event, all participants will receive a special summary report of today's proceedings. Okay, on with the show and our first panel, How Leaders Delude Themselves About Disruption. Our panelists for this session are Scott, panelists for this session are Scott D. Anthony, senior partner at the Growth Strategy Consultancy in the site, and co-author of Dual Transformation, How to Reposition Today's Business While Creating the Future, and Michael Putz. Michael is a strategy and business development executive with two decades of experience driving growth through disruptive innovation and business transformation. Gentlemen, welcome to you both. Oh, Karen, thanks for having both of us. It's a delight to be here. Great to see you both. Well, terrific. Let's dive right in. Um, and let's begin, let's begin at the beginning. So implied clearly in this session's title and explored in your work is the notion that leaders still do not fully understand disruption, even 25 years after Christensen first identified the innovator's dilemma. So Michael, let, let, let's bring you up first. Let's do a quick refresh on the innovator's dilemma and why it so stubbornly persists. Well, thank you, Paul, for having us here today. And the innovator's dilemma is, um, when it first came out, it was something was brand new and challenging. It was also a technical challenge. Um, that people really did, it was, that we're unfamiliar with. But over the last 25 years since Clay offered this article up to the world, it's been clear that we've had a lot of practice, a lot of people have been successful at moving through the implementation, it, working with people like Scott and his com company, Innosite, in terms of implementing the innovator's dilemma in real life practice. And so we've seen a lot of success stories as well as failures, but a lot of success stories of people who've applied the principles of disruptive innovation. The question is not really as why the dilemma persists, but why is it the implement the success not more widespread? And that's really what I think the really what I want to say this. I think people have done very well. There are a lot of success stories, but why are there not more? And I think that's really what we're trying to speak to in our article is why can't there be more people more successful more frequently? And um, and so there's not just a few winners. And I think really the challenge is, is that it used to be a technical challenge that people were not familiar. Now the question is, 
why do people sometimes fail even with the best of intentions? And, and really, and so that's really the issue. And we see the consistent, we talk about the lies people tell themselves, but it really comes down to the fact that disruptive innovation is something that's not only different, but the opposite of sustaining innovation in terms of the practices, the models, the values that you have to practice. And the challenge is that requires a very different mindset. As a matter of fact, the opposite of mindset of a sustaining innovation. Sustaining innovation is one school of discipline and thought, disruption is a different one, and they're oppositional. And because they're oppositional, it requires us to toggle between mindsets that are so different, it's very difficult to do. And it's difficult to do, and it's not a matter of intelligence, it's not a matter of skill, it's really a matter of awareness. And oftentimes that awareness is about ourselves, about our values, how we operate as leaders, our values of our organization. A lot of those things could be unconscious, unconscious biases. We have to be able to have that perspective for ourselves, for our teams and our organizations, and it requires a level of discipline that we oftentimes don't have to practice or haven't had the opportunity to practice. And that's a lot, a lot of what the real persistence of the innovator's dilemma is about. So is this a is this a strategic challenge or a leadership challenge? Where how do we, you know, where do we balance those two? Well, I think of, I think it's a both and. Um, it requires a discipline that we many, many leaders talk about of having looking to the future, working from the future backwards. We have to have that strategic discipline, but a lot of excellent companies have that. But oftentimes the question is, why do we, we then fall short of implementing those strategic plans that a lot of the people who follow this journal know have, have the skills to implement? And a lot of times they fall short because they haven't been able to toggle the mindsets. It's a lot of times it's a strategic offsite about the future, but can I bring it back into practice? It's a discipline that I have to practice on a daily or weekly or monthly basis and develop skill with as opposed to being an offsite on an activity. If I can just have so Scott, uh, one thing. Just what one thing to that, Paul. So uh, if you look at the school of thought that, that Clay was from, the resource-based view of the firm, going back to Joe Bauer and other great scholars, one of the big beliefs in that view of the firm is that the right strategy is never more than 49% of the answer. So yes, of course, there's been a lot of work that has been done to help people formulate strategically how to respond to disruptive change, and it's wholly insufficient because you also have to go and execute it, and that requires leadership, and that requires driving it inside the culture of the organization. Right. So at the core of the persistence of this challenge, right, are these are are the delusions that many leaders kind of bring um, to their bring to their thinking about innovation. So Scott, I'm gonna I'm gonna give the floor over to you to talk about some of those delusions. Yeah. Well, of course, the whole innovator's dilemma it rests on one of those big delusions, which is the idea that your customers tell you what you should do. So the basic idea of the innovator's dilemma, for those of you who might not still be familiar with the work, is in certain circumstances you listen to your best customers, you do exactly what they tell you to do, better, improved versions of what you're currently doing, and you miss the big industry shift where someone comes in and changes the paradigm with something that's simple, that's accessible, that's affordable. And the lesson from Christensen original research is sometimes listening to your customers can be the wrong thing to do because they unintentionally lie to you. That, that's kind of the, the primary argument in the innovator's dilemma. Where we try to advance is to say, well, what are other lies that leaders tell themselves that cause them to miss disruptive signals or mismanage response to disruptive change? And there were four key ones we identified in the article. The first is the data tells us we are safe. Remember, data tells you about the past, not about the future. You can be in the midst of a disruptive storm and report record revenues and record profits. The second thing that you will hear people say is our shareholders won't let us, that we don't have the freedom to go and do this, where in fact you absolutely do if you manage your shareholders in the right sort of way. You'll have people say that our people aren't up to the task. They don't have the innate skills to be able to respond to disruptive change. They absolutely do. We can talk more about counterexamples to this if you'd like, but you have to release them and deal with some of the issues that Michael talked about. And the fourth thing we identified in the article is people will say, it's too risky to do this. It's too risky to bet on disruption. It's too risky to invest in innovation. Think about that for a second. Think about a notable failure that's occurred in the innovation field. And you might imagine Google Glass or Microsoft Zoom or a range of other things. And those are not good things, but when companies make big bets on innovation, the most they can lose is the amount they invest. The most they can gain is limitless. They can create entirely new ecosystems. When they don't invest in innovation, the most they gain, zero. The most they lose is their entire organization. 
So what's the risky thing to do? Is it to invest in innovation or to not invest in innovation? I think it's pretty clear. So those are the key things we identified in the article. So let's talk about a couple of those um, in a little bit more detail. When are customers right and when not? How do we know when to listen? I don't think you're suggesting that we should ignore our customers altogether. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll, I'll say two things here. And of course, we could say a lot more about this. But, you know, Michael introduced the, the fundamental categorization scheme that, that Christensen used, sustaining versus disruptive. So in sustaining circumstances, when what you offer is not yet good enough to solve fundamental customer problems in a given tier of the market, the customers can be very reliable guides to what it takes to deliver against the problem they're trying to solve. So when you're in a known established market and you're still trying to make things better so customers can draw more utility out of your products, absolutely, existing customers can lead the way. That also points to the other way that customers can guide you. And this was a theme of the book, Competing Against Luck, which is one of the ones that Karen wrote with Clay along with my colleague, Dave Duncan. The idea in that book, as many people who follow Christensen and Innosite will know, is that the job to be done, the problem the customer is trying to solve, is essentially true north when it comes to innovation. Customers don't always have language to describe the problems they're trying to solve. But if you can work to understand what those problems are, those are always fantastic guides to innovation. The challenge, of course, with that is you often can't go ask customers to tell you what the jobs to be done are. It requires work to surface them. But if you do that work, it is hugely valuable input to innovation. So, Michael, I'm going to turn this back over to you and, and talk about you know, what it means for leaders themselves to operate in, the, in this environment. How do, we, how do we get to a place where we are effective innovation leaders? Well, one of the key things is, you know, first of all, like we've been talking about, the very nature of the fact that we're stepping out of a context. You know, like the, we're fish that swim in water. We've been raised in a discipline of sustaining innovation. And that's what most of our jobs are about. Even in a great company that's a disruptor, their job is to deliver every day on making that disruption better, faster, or cheaper for their customers once they've established themselves. So you become a successful disruptor like a Google or an Amazon. A lot of your job is sustaining innovation, even if you're a disruptive company, because what is what is sustaining to us can be disruptive to somebody else. And so everybody in the game of sustaining innovation, even the great disruptors. So the challenge is, is having them be able to toggle that mindset, right? Where I basically say, most of my day-to-day -day job is sustaining innovation, but I have a separate context for disruptive innovation. And when Clay really said in his second book, The Innovator's Solution, he basically said the way of solving this dilemma of having an opposite context was to step outside and have a separate organization that created these new disruptions, right? Something that might be disruptive to an Amazon or a Google or a Netflix. If I was something that disrupted to them, I might have a separate organization to do that, that have different values and a different orientation. The challenge is you create a, a problem of this context switching we talked about. You bump it up to a set of senior leaders who have to embrace that. So you have to understand there's a context where I have to make this toggling on a daily basis. Most of the time, as Clay said, if I have a disruptive organization that has one set of values, let people focus on that and a sustaining the organization have another set of values. The challenge is for a set of senior leaders who have to be able to embrace this or people who are working at different levels of the organization, they have to span these two functions. Then I have to basically acknowledge this context, first of all, embrace the fact that it's very oppositional and different and, know, and take that as a starting point, which is absolutely essential. People just don't really recognize that fundamental point. They read over and go, yes, 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 I understand that. So really important to embrace that point and to internalize it, then develop a discipline to say, well, how am I doing? And how am I showing up in this moment, this day or this hour in a sustaining context or disruptive context and make that context switch? So once I've acknowledged that necessity, and then I can then have to pra develop practices and be able to develop internal set of skills to be able to make that context which happen more, more readily and work more, more effectively. Michael, how is the how is this discipline, right? And it's significant in in the easiest of times, I would think, but how is this discipline to context which challenged by the environment we're living in right now? Is that too much to ask? I, you know, it's <clears throat> in some ways our daily lives have always been challenging, especially for people who are trying to manage in, in, in these situations of you know, aggressive change, lots of competitors, lots of demands, your jobs, Scott's jobs, the people that you consult with. They've always been demanding. This time, 
I think it provides a moment of clarity because we have to step outside ourselves. And stepping outside ourselves is one of the key skills to be able to manage this, this dilemma, right? I have to be able to step outside myself and examine myself objectively. And it's, and it's more essential than ever to have developed that muscle in difficult times. But it's also difficult when we go back to a, our new normal, whatever that may end up being, it's going to be a very essential to develop this capacity, not only for ourselves, but also for our teams and our organizations. But right now, it puts a spotlight when we're in these difficult times to, to, under, to really have that skill for ourselves. Can we if talk I a could add one thing. Yeah, I'm sorry, Paul, can I just add one, one, one thing to that? So I, I think if we were to write the paper right now, we would say another lie that we're hearing leaders say is it isn't the right time for us to do this because we, we have to focus on, on making sure that we deal with the issues of today. And of course, you have to, inside any organization, you have to flatten the economic curve. You have to make sure that your business is solvent, your operations are running, your employees are safe. And you have to have the ability to step back step out, see things for as they are, and recognize no matter how dark the clouds, there is always a silver lining. There are always great opportunities. There are always great things that you can do. It is indeed brutally hard, but to say we, it isn't the right time to do it is absolutely wrong. There has never been a better time if you really want to push innovation and disruption than in times of dislocation, because that's when opportunities open up. Hard, yes, but important, no doubt. Is it possible to lean, I mean, I think the inclination of some leaders is to pull back and say, it's not the right time, this is scary enough. Then there are leaders who are gonna do the opposite. They're gonna lean They're gonna lean more strongly in, right? right? Is that always, I mean, is that necessarily the right call? But I would say that's a judgment call in some situations, but I think the, the, the most, I, I, the question is, I think for, is if um, having this discipline, before it's necessary is absolutely the key, right? Mm -hmm. So if someone has been developing a disciplined approach to disruptive innovation, also a disciplined approach to, the, to leadership and their own self-management, then it's gonna be so much easier to seize opportunities in this moment or the next opportunity that comes along and this next dislocation. So it's really about developing this capacity. It's an, it's, it, it's a, it helps now in this critical moment, it helps now in the future or for the next major dislocation. It's absolutely essential to develop this capacity. There's no time when it's not important to do. And I don't think there's any time you should set this aside. I think it's a great opportunity right now. Great, so I'm gonna begin incorporating some of the great questions that are coming in from our audience. And thank you all very much for your generosity of questions. Scott, this one is for you. How can employees um, be empowered when they aren't first given job guarantees? So we're asking people to, um, to engage in riskier behavior, perhaps with a higher degree um, of likelihood um, of failure. Do we need to provide some kind of extraordinary job security before we ask this of people? So there's a lot loaded into that question, and one can start getting into universal basic income and topics that are above my pay grade. So I, I, I don't know that I can talk on the macroeconomic and policy perspective, but let me talk about the word risk. So I, I think one of the big misperceptions that we have to handle is when we start talking about innovation, doing something different that creates value, pushing to disruptive innovation, we're asking people to take on risk. That is not necessarily the case if we approach it in the right sort of way. So we do have to find ways to manage that risk in the right way. We do have to find ways to make sure our environment can tolerate smart experiments, can tolerate that sometimes those experiments won't work, and we will view that as learning versus failure. But that doesn't necessarily mean we're saying, let's go and take undue risk and do stupid things. Instead, we're gonna be very smart about how we manage the risk so we can push in different directions. Let's so I don't think, I don't think the summary answer to that is, I don't think we need job guarantees to do it. I think we need to make sure that we have environments that if you channel Amy Edmondson's research, we have environments that can tolerate intelligent failures. And we wanna be really intelligent about how we approach disruption. Let's look at risk from um, another perspective. Um, so risk is one thing and shareholder expectations are another. The trap of quarterly earnings guidance is not easy to extract from. Um, so we can urge organizations to take risks, but if their stakeholders aren't willing to go along with that, they can only get so far. 
Yeah, so uh, a couple points about this. You know, first we we talk a little bit in the article about the just stunning stream of research that continues to show that if you want to maximize the short-term returns that you're giving to your shareholders, the thing you have to do is to think long-term. So those who think and act short-term paradoxically destroy short-term short-term return for shareholders. So uh, that's point number one that has to be acknowledged. Point number two is this, when people start talking about it, it's often a crutch. They just don't want to do something that is difficult because, again, you have plenty of examples of people who manage to take their shareholders along a journey, sometimes changing some of them because those shareholders wanted to invest in a different sort of company. We talk about Mark Bertolini from Aetna as an example in the article, and there are, of course, other ones. I think the mistake that people make is, one, they assume it's too hard, and number two, they don't tell shareholders the story. So in a book that a couple of my colleagues recently released this week, as a matter of fact, Lead from the Future, Mark Johnson and Josh Suskowitz, the big point is you need a vision, you need a story, and you need a path to get there. So this isn't a CEO telling their shareholders, trust me, it's all going to be okay. It's here's the destination, here are the milestones along the way, and here's the proof points that I'm actually getting there. You can't have this be based on faith. I mean, it's got to be based on a real well-grounded story and demonstrated results. If you do that, though, you certainly can manage a strategic transformation, drive disruption, and reap the rewards. Is it easy? Of course not. But is it doable? For sure. So related to that point, we've gotten some, some questions around measurement. So what, what, are some, what, what are your recommendations around effective measures of innovation, especially for an organization that is moving to a more aggressive posture for the first time? Uh, I'll start, and, and Michael, if you want to add anything on that, that please feel free. But you know, when we think about about measuring innovation, uh, this will draw on, of course, some of the great work that that Rita McGrath, who who will be speaking a little bit later on, has done. It's really about how do you smartly manage the assumptions behind your idea. And so you know, you you go back to some of McGrath's seminal work. You reverse engineer success. You say, for this to be a big idea, these things need to be true. And how are we systematically turning those assumptions into knowledge? How are we demonstrably increasing what we know and decreasing what we don't know? So that means in the early days of innovation, it's much more about learning than it is about earning. Now, of course, ultimately, innovation has to create value. You're not just doing it for fun. So that has to be tied to a story and an economic model that ultimately will make sense. But as Scott Cook from Intuit famously once said, for every one of our failures, we had spreadsheets that looked awesome. Awesome spreadsheets do not mean awesome ideas. It is really drilling into the assumptions underneath it and addressing them and recognizing sometimes when you go to try and address an assumption and it turns out that something that you thought was true was false, it's time to stop. And that again is a good outcome, not a bad outcome if it happens early enough in the process. Um, Michael, so there are a couple of questions that I think are in your bailiwick. Um, one one audience member described the kind of uh, competing mindsets or ability to move between mindsets as an ambidextrous skill that most managers don't have. Can they learn it on the fly? Is there training available? Um, yeah, so I, I, uh, the ambidextrous mindset work is, I think, very complementary. Um, I think that we're, we've looked for a way of trying to describe the phenomenon with a discipline model, we basically look towards, there are different, there are a variety of different ways of looking at, it, but we talked about uh, self-transforming leadership. You know, we've talked about the work of Bob Keegan, who talks about different stages of leadership development, about in terms of the ability to basically master a new mindset and then stand outside of a mindset and be able to toggle between them, right? And so there's a there's a lot of wonderful work has been done to describe the nature of this, this mindset and awareness, but also how to develop it. And there's been a lot of work since the publication of the innovators dilemma that have come out there's been a lot of increase in terms of being able uh, of the tools to basically practically move towards a self-transforming leadership mindset we, we talk about self-transforming leadership mindset in our paper it's the ability to toggle between these two um disruptive and sustaining mindsets necessary to be successful in each and there is there's a whole set of i think there's a whole set of programs out there that are tools that are helpful i don't think there's any one place you can go to say this is how i become a self-transforming leader today right there's no there's no cookie cutter solution to it um but there's a lot of tools that can people can start to journey with and i think we can talk later maybe in a different uh, if, through the different questions here it, i think it's really essential to see 
that there's a whole variety, especially during this uh, COVID-19 uh, emergency, there's a tremendous number of online tools out there right now for people to develop skills for self-introspection, for mindfulness, for, for personal development, and be able to have this ability to toggle between mindsets. Um, the key is to having the support, not only of, your, of doing this yourself, but having peers and having teams to do this. This is not a solo journey. So I think that there's plenty of tools out there, but it's critical to have a supportive environment. If you don't have a team or an organization supporting the development of this capacity, to create a team of your own to do this. And I think it's really critical. This is not a solo act. So I think it's, it's, there's a lot of tools for self-initiation out there. We can talk more about them, but it's really critical to develop peer support to do this. This is, not a, this is a team activity. I think people who are interested in, 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 in this would love to hear um, you know, a tool or two. Don't worry if you're, if you're giving a plug for somebody, if you, if you think there are some tools that are useful. Absolutely. So I think, I think a couple of things out there. So first of all, I'll say mindfulness in general. Right? I think mindfulness tools and techniques in general are very wonderful. There's, and, and everyone can find the tools out there that sit, suit them. There's a, a vast variety of corporate mindfulness that's been exploded, in the, exploded out there right now. A tool I like to pull, call out is another thing that Bob Keegan started over 20 years ago. It's his immunity to change framework. And his immunity to change framework, um, we can people can look it up online. There's a lot of wonderful tools out there for the, the immunity to change framework is basically saying, I have an aspiration. I want to be able to toggle between mindsets more effectively. I write down a goal. Then I basically have to then surface, what are my competing commitments? What do I have as an internal commitment between that stops me from making this change? And then looking at my big assumptions. So the idea of the immunity to change tool is to create a disciplined process of setting a new improvement goal, understanding what our, what our objectives are, and then what our competing commitments are between, like, it's like, for example, if we want to go through a process of weight loss, you know, I have a, com a, a, a commitment to a diet, but I have a lot of other commitments to feeling comfortable, to like, for example, enjoying using food for comfort or for stress management. And I have to understand that competing commitment and the assumptions behind those commitments, because if I don't change my competing commitments and my internal big assumptions that hope make the anchor those commitments in place, then it's going to be very hard for me to change my behavior because I'll go back to my, no, my, my, my old normal. And so Bob Keegan's tool is really great for surfacing the competing commitments that, sh that block us from change. And then mindfulness is a way for us to stay present with those challenges and say, look at them objectively so we can change them. We talked earlier about the importance of um, maintaining a commitment to innovation, even perhaps accelerating it during this, during the pandemic itself. But the pandemic is likely, I think it's safe to say, to be followed by a period, perhaps an extended period, of some pretty severe economic uncertainty. Right. Innovation is often something that gets looked at for the chopping block as companies kind of, you know, um, pull themselves in and just try to survive. So perhaps with a couple of minutes left, you could each offer some closing thoughts to leaders listening to us today about how to maintain their commitment during this time. Scott? Uh Okay, I'll, I'll go first. Well, it, it helps when you've written a book on this topic, and, and I have. It, it not about pandemics. It was called The Silver Lining. It came out right after the global financial crisis, and the, the research that we did for that book was very, very stunningly clear. That is, opportunities to innovate and grow exist no matter how dark the times. So you see in any kind of crisis, you see established companies making big moves that separate themselves from competitors. Adobe started its very aggressive and impressive dual transformation starting in 2007 when Shintano Narayan took over as the CEO of the company. Number two, you see great new companies born in the midst of a downturn. There were about 100 unicorns that came out in the global financial crisis, many of them reverbing off of parts of the crisis. So you have the asset sharing platforms are formed as people are a little bit tighter with their purse strings. You have new financial services providers like Stripe and Square because there isn't trust in mainstream providers. Similarly, we're going to see some awesome reverb opportunities that come out, out of this pandemic. And then the final thing you see is on the brink disruptors that have kind of laid the foundation. They go and take the next big step. And, you know, of course, Zoom is one example that a lot of people talk about. But there are dozens of companies out there that are just knocking on the door of the main stream that are going to do the same thing here. So I think the number one piece of advice to leaders is look to history and recognize that while it might not repeat, as Mark Twain said, it certainly rhymes. And we can see some really optimistic stories in the past. And those that have the courage to do it will reap the rewards. Those who don't will regret that they didn't. 
Scott, thank you very much. Michael, if you've got 15 seconds for a goodbye, it's all yours. I can't say I, so I, can't, say I can't agree more. Uh, I've seen great companies, you know, I've worked at great companies in the past, they look at these crises as opportunities to push forward on their disruptive initiatives. Absolutely, they move in and sometimes they can see their competitors pulling back and it's the perfect time to move forward. And I think there's no better time uh, to move forward right now with your disruptive initiatives. Great. Scott, Anthony, Michael Putz, thank you for getting our day off to a fantastic start. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. I am pleased to be joined today by Michael Horn, who is co-author of the recently released Choosing College, Chief Strategy Officer of the Entangle Group, an education venture studio, and perhaps most significantly to me, co-founder of the Clayton Christensen Institute. And he was Clayton Christensen's longtime collaborator. They together explored and developed the theory of disrupted ed education. And when we first assigned Michael to uh, write for the special issue, we had a lot to talk about, but boy, do we have a lot to talk about now. Welcome, Michael, to our symposium. Thanks so much for having me, Karen. It's a, a you know real treat to be with you. <laughs> okay, great. So I'm going to start by asking you to talk about the article that we worked on for SMR, but of course we have a lot more to talk about beyond that. So the initial idea that I asked you to write about was you're you're seeing so ahead of the rest of us on what's happening in all forms of disruptive education. Um, I'd love you to talk about first of all what you mean by that. What is the concept of disruptive education, and particularly? I'd like to know what companies are doing that in their own way is disrupting traditional forms of training and education. So let's start with that and then we're gonna move into the current, the current things. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, look, disruptive innovation in education uh, is basically, you know, a technology enabler comes in, does not look as good as traditional education. That sort of rarefied air uh, of the seminar, right, with the professor and so forth. But in this case, we've seen online learning come in uh, to be able to uh, give access and affordability uh, to mil literally millions of uh, individuals around the globe to get access to education, which is better than their alternative, nothing at all, uh, has planted itself there literally a couple decades ago at this point, and has gotten better and better and better year over year over year. Uh, and uh, we've seen online education really start to disrupt uh, traditional education systems at the low end uh, and continue to get better and better. And so in the corporate context, uh, what we've seen over the last many years is a couple things. One, large parts of the training and continuing education operation that used to be done uh, in person have moved to online and digital formats. Uh, and then secondly, uh, I think before COVID-19 hit, we were just starting to see corporations move rather aggressively to start thinking about the continuing education uh, and education training uh, that they did not as a nice to have uh, uh, sort of benefit on the side, but really as a strategic move to use it uh, to drive uh, value and to drive uh, key performance improvements uh, of individuals um, and actually start to measure the return on investment from these investments uh, in digital and online learning to actually improve the performance of the companies themselves uh, and the individuals and, and the retention of those individuals. So we were really starting to see uh, I, I would say this wave of disruptive innovation actually start to pop into the mainstream and become a strategic asset as opposed to a nice to have. So explain what you mean by that. What were they actually doing and offering and how was it becoming a talent retention strategy or a strategy for getting ahead of the competition? What kinds of things were you seeing and, and who was doing it? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the, the, the biggest and best known example perhaps uh, was Arizona State uh, University several years ago. Uh, partnered with Starbucks famously to offer online education to all of the baristas and employees in Starbucks, uh, basically as a, education as a benefit and started seeing uh, dramatic uh, improvements in terms of retention and so forth in, in the Starbucks family. Guild Education, then a company uh, that is now a unicorn, a company came along and said, you know, actually managing for companies the interface with education organizations is incredibly challenging. We'll do this with a, a portfolio of colleges and universities and, uh, and offer it as a benefit on our platform uh, to employers. And so they started with Chipotle, uh, Walmart, Disney, and other large scale employers like that. And they've been measuring the return on investment and getting stunning uh, improvements basically for every dollar you invest in education as a benefit for employees. Employees are far more likely to stay at the company. 
have uh, much more loyalty, express satisfaction, engagement goes up, uh, and so forth. And Guild has started to measure these uh, in pretty robust ways to allow employers like Walmart to be able to make very strategic choices uh, about the program mix that they're offering their employees and where do they want to deploy them uh, so that they can upskill their employee labor force. I guess the other quick example would be Amazon, uh, which, you know, uh, uh, about six months ago, which feels like an eternity ago now, uh, announced that they were going to uh, spend $700 million over the next few years uh, upskilling 100,000 of their 300,000 employees. They basically saw the risks of artificial intelligence and technological automation coming in, said that people are still going to be very important to our operations in, in, in sort of using what I would call human skills, uh, differentiated from these rote-based uh, tasks that machines can do quite well. And they said, you know, we actually think that corporations, excuse me, universities on their own are not going to be able to upskill these people quickly enough and with the skill sets that we need, we're going to make a direct investment in helping these 100,000 uh, employees skill up uh, for our future. And so they started investing. They have partnered with many outside organizations to offer online solutions uh, to their uh, em employees, but they're also offering their own classroom spaces, in effect, uh, for these employees, raising the question, will Amazon itself at some point do some of this education directly? They employ some uh, leading researchers on the future of online education already that they've poached from places like Stanford. They might just, frankly, create these training materials uh, themselves and do an end run around the uh, higher education system to upskill employees. So a lot to break down there. Let me let me go back and ask some questions, and we'll go back to the Amazon because that's sort of interesting and scary, right? Uh, yeah. What does your crystal ball tell us is going to happen, you know, next year and in the years after? Uh, with uh, college level uh, education and what are we learning now that's useful and what are we learning now that's that's a bad sign? Yeah, so I, I you know, look, it's it's really uncertain for traditional colleges and universities right now. The big driver of that is we don't know if they'll open up in the fall, right? And so already we're seeing significant numbers of students saying uh, that they are planning to attend college much closer to home just in case they have to evacuate all of a sudden, get back home quickly, as, you know, your own daughter had to uh, from from across the pond, as they said, uh, yeah. as they yeah. say to, to, to you. Um, uh, and uh, a lot of students are saying we're going to take a gap year. We're going to defer. Uh, admission. We're going to take a break. We're going to attend only part-time. So I think what you're going to see is a significant reduction in sort of that traditional 18 to 22-year-old uh, student who is going to attend if a lot of schools are unable to open uh, as regularly planned in the fall. I, I My own gut is that you know, that could be more than 10% enrollment drop, frankly, across the sector. Uh, and then I think in turn, that could hit revenues uh, upwards of close to 20%, frankly. Uh, if we see that occur, then we'll see a lot of uh, colleges and universities not be able to withstand uh, that sort of a crunch, frankly. And we'll see a number of them close or declare the equivalent of higher education's version of bankruptcy, which is called financial exigency, basically allows them to break contracts that they have existing uh, with their professors, uh, with uh, building payments and things of that nature to get out of and untangle uh, contracts that are holding them back. And we'll see a fair amount of restructuring. We've already seen one public institution do that. In, uh, that was in the state of Washington. In the state of Vermont, we see that three colleges uh, campuses are saying that they are likely to close. There's going to be a vote on that next Monday, so we'll, we'll, we will see what happens. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of, right now, uh, turmoil in that space. In terms of the broader impact on online education, uh, I think it's going to be both bad and good. In, in, in the margins, I think a lot of students, as you all were saying, who are experiencing this version of online learning from a traditional institution, when it's not done well, them, their parents, and faculty are going to say, if that's online learning, I want no part of it. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> but I think at the margins, you're going to see more students start to say two things. One, uh, particularly adult learners, those who were in the workforce until recently and have been laid off, they're going to go to the most affordable online program out there, and they're going to look at some uh, operations that have been doing this for a really long time and doing it really well. So Western Governors University, Southern New Hampshire University, uh, uh, Arizona State University, places like that that do online learning well, do it affordably, they're going to come to those options. And then secondly, I think some uh, students who are, you know, were going to go to a physical campus say, 
you know, if I'm not going to get that physical campus experience, I don't want to pay $50,000 plus uh, to attend online in a crummy experience, but I still do want to keep learning in my studies at an accredited uni university. And I think they'll start looking for some online options that are affordable, even if it's a class or two, or maybe they'll take four just to get ahead of semester and then they'll transfer back at some point. But those experiences, I think, will create a more positive image of online learning. So I, I think it's going to be both bad and good. Uh, for, for online education, but the longer that the crisis goes, I predict the more people will look for online learning uh, as a place where they can learn during the pandemic, they can stay in the sa uh, safety of their homes, uh, and frankly, they can upskill, and those who get uh, go to really good experiences, I think will start voting with their feet, and that will just simply fuel the rise further of the disruptive innovators, which is to say, you know, we shouldn't expect a lot of the traditional institutions to actually do the disruptive innovation. These upstart institutions will be the ones that uh, over time gain volume, and that's where the disruption will really occur. And, and COVID-19, I think, has accelerated that process. Like Southern New Hampshire University, which none of us probably knew at all 15 years ago and is now one of the most innovative and successful online uh, universities in the world. That's right. I, you know, it's excess of 130,000 students now. So uh, just to take you back when Paul LeBlanc, the uh, president there, uh, who, who readers are, are, of course, familiar with, uh, when he started at Southern New Hampshire University, this was a struggling small liberal arts college in New Hampshire that was frankly on the brink of going out of business, potentially. They had only a couple thousand students in the brick and mortar. And he noticed that they had this small online operation, which you've written about in Competing Against Luck, of course, as well. Uh, they really realized, hey, one, from Clay research, this should be treated as a separate uh, entity, not confused with the brick and mortar operations. And two, from a jobs to be done perspective, they realized that these are adult learners who are coming to us in, in the language of our book, Choosing College. They want to step it up in their lives. They sort of feel like it's now or never. Other people are depending on them. Uh, and their uh, turnaround times for getting enrolled and uh, moving through the program are dramatically different from a junior uh, in high school, say, who's just putting in an inquiry about what is the uh, brick and mortar physical education experience like. And as, as you know, you write about compellingly, uh, in competing against luck, that changed everything from a process perspective uh, for Southern New Hampshire University. All of a sudden, they realized they needed to give response times in terms of financial aid letters uh, in matters of seconds, minutes, and hours, as opposed to months and years in some cases. Uh, it meant that you had to have life coaches there uh, to support the online learners because you weren't going to be physically proximate with them and, and support them, uh, not just into the experience, but then through uh, to graduation and into jobs in some cases. So a dramatic restructuring as a result, uh, once they realized what an online student the job to be done that they had and they've as you said you know experienced unbelievable growth to over 130,000 students now uh, if I, I believe they're the largest university uh, by students uh, in, in, in the United States now and they uh, are continuing to grow and I suspect they will continue to do quite well serving Americans getting back into the job market uh, during these tough times that you you raised a question about them putting in uh, online coaches basically to help students along when you don't have face to face uh, that brings us to we have a lot of questions from from our audience let me start with a few of these uh, and we may have touched upon some of these topics a bit but I'm going to go faithfully to the questions so one of our listeners says when we think about innovation we think about tacit knowledge learning by doing the transferring of tacit knowledge demands face-to-face -face interaction so how can online education deal properly with that the fact that there is not Based, I mean, I guess there is face to face, but not in the same way. There's not learning by doing so, obviously. What do you see that can bridge that gap? Or is that is that a gap that's even a gap in reality? Is is that just something we think is one way, but there are other ways of doing it? Yeah, so I, I, I would love people to step back one a little bit and, and consider what the typical education experience is for many Americans uh, in higher education, which is not a very small seminar in a uh, or, or lab-based experience um, for, for, for folks. It's often a large lecture hall uh, where you're in undifferentiated masses. Clay Christensen, when he was alive, uh, used to joke that distance learning has been alive and well for anyone past the 10th row uh, of a lecture hall for a long time, uh, that this is not actually a new phenomenon. That having been said, uh, I'll address the question a little bit more in the spirit that it's offered, which is to say that online learning, actually um, the, the faculty members say they get to know their students better in online environments when it's done well uh, than in brick and mortar ones. And that's because you construct 
uh, incredibly active learning experiences where there's very little lecture. Uh, it's you, you can watch a little bit of content asynchronously, so not in the class session. And then you're using the class session really to answer questions, to have conversations with your peers, uh, to work with your faculty member. And you can actually see each other often uh, in, in immersive learning environments like what the Minerva Project offers. They have an active learning platform, which if anyone wants to just check out, the, there's an Atlantic article from a few years back describing what this thing is like. It is the most intense, incredible educational experience you you, you can possibly experience. Uh, there are lab simulations that you can do from companies like Labster for those sorts of parts of the uh, experience, um, and on and on and on. And basically, you can mix and match different modalities in a variety of ways and create personalized pathways uh, for individuals so that, you know, frankly, we don't always learn through social means. Sometimes you learn through reading a book or just having solitary study when you can consume uh, some content uh, on the internet, and then you come together as a group to do something with in a synchronous or asynchronous uh, uh, format. There's a lot of different ways to do this depending on what the learning objective is, uh, and you can construct these environments. And then the last piece of this is, in my estimation, before COVID-19 hit, really the upmarket move uh, for online learning was to start to snap in brick and mortar hybrid uh, components to create stronger senses of community for learners. And so uh, what in the same way, you know, uh, Macy's and, and department stores have been, uh, you know, are being disrupted by online retailers. But interestingly enough, retailers like Bonobos, Warby Parker, even Amazon uh, now offer a brick and mortar uh, uh, experience alongside the online where they don't carry nearly as much inventory. It's a much smaller uh, storefront experience and so forth, but it creates a sense of, of, of things you can't do online. We're starting to see something very similar occur uh, in online education where companies like 2U are partnering with co-working spaces to provide community for online learners. Uh, we're seeing Southern New Hampshire University, for example, acquired uh, a digital learning provider called LRNG that has campus, uh, campuses throughout the entire country. Uh, and so learners can gather and congregate now in specific areas uh, as fits their schedule, given that many of them are working jobs uh, when, when this was occurring, um, and, uh, and be able to get these community experiences and have strong mentors alongside of them who, who really support them and make sure that they do the learning that, that's needed for them to make progress. Let me ask you a question. If I were, uh, if I'm in a, a company that has most of my workforce working virtually right now, uh, and I've been on lots of Zoom calls, you've been on lots of Zoom calls. Um, what can those companies learn from what's been successful in disrupt disrupted education, you know, online learning um, that they can employ in their own everyday communications, their their collaboration? Is there are there any tools or practices that companies should be looking to borrow or learn from from education to make a better uh, employee experience? Yeah, you know, so I think there are some lessons that they can learn. One, I think, is streamlining communications, not overwhelming uh, employees with a barrage of lots of emails and sort of addendums and modular uh, communications from different departments updating people, really figuring out how do I communicate in a consistent basis that's in, uh, understandable one place and doesn't overwhelm the individual. It's something that good online providers are very clear about uh, not overwhelming people with too many assignments, say, or too many updates. We're seeing the pitfalls, frankly, of it right now in school districts where parents are uh, crying for stop uh, as as they get overwhelmed by communications and just sort of can't keep up. The second big thing is engagement and, and active experiences. So long experiences uh, where people are disconnected or sort of passively absorbing things uh, just doesn't work very well. And it, it's similar in meeting culture in, in companies where uh, having touch points is important, but having them be active where everyone feels like they're on the edge of their seats and contributing, uh, that's where you get the most uh, engagement from employees. People feel like they're part of the team uh, as opposed to sort of um, uh, having passive experiences where maybe you have a meeting, but it's really dominated by one or two people. You want to really avoid those mass experiences, if you will, uh, that replicate the worst of meeting culture uh, or, or the worst of, of, of traditional environments. Um, 
Uh, and then the third one I would say is what we're starting to see in disruptive, uh, uh, in the world of disruptive education approaches is a move to mobile learning increasingly, where uh, people can just literally pick up their phone, have a very quick micro experience, learning a few things in a very active, engaging way of uh, answering questions and things of that nature. Um, I, I think using mobile formats in certain ways uh, with employees, um, both in the upskilling of them, um, but also, frankly, in terms of communication vehicles, you know, Slack and things like that work very well on the mobile devices uh, for, for companies. It creates just a very light way for people to stay in touch, uh, but it doesn't overburden them uh, at the same time. And I think there's some tips to be learned from, from the move to mobile uh, in education. Let me ask another uh, audience question, uh, which is a totally different subject, but when you talk about sort of less than perfect things, uh, I think this is a painful and interesting question to see what your thoughts are on. Uh, what about what's become very obvious to all of us, the, the, the gap, the socioeconomic gap between yeah. schools and parents and families that are quickly able to have laptops for kids and bandwidth and, and cameras so they can continue learning, and so many of the lower income public schools where it's just not an option. Even the best case scenario, maybe the computer, is, there's a computer in the classroom or the teacher has a computer. Uh, what, if anything, can, can be done to help make that gap not so gaping and horrible for people who don't find themselves with all of the technology sort of at their fingertips just to figure out how to use better? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, look, one, the federal government can play a role here in the same way that uh, in the 30s they turned on electricity for rural environments. Uh, I think at this point, internet connectivity is the same sort of utility, if you will. Uh, and so you could see the federal government uh, start to step up and provide uh, internet connectivity uh, uh, to uh, low-income households across uh, the country. I think that would be a prudent first step. That's what the school uh, federal government did, frankly, to connect school buildings and classrooms, which five years ago did not have high-speed uh, internet connectivity in many of them. Uh, today, 99% have connectivity in all their classrooms. Uh, so you can see that sort of a movement there. The second thing I think is that uh, companies and uh, education organizations themselves actually ought to use their budgets to uh, uh, basically pay for uh, the low-income uh, folks that work with them and need access uh, or low-income students and give them that connectivity and hardware that they need. And that's actually a good use of budgets is not necessarily to spend on a one-to-one -one laptop uh, in the school environment, say for every single child, but for a uh, an individual that truly can't afford it, has financial hardship, I think that's an important expenditure. And you actually want a device, uh, say, you know, you've got three kids in high school <laughs> or something like that. You want each of them to have their own device. You, that's not something that's a shared resource in a household. And so having providers and the government actually directly support that, I think, is important. All right. And our final thoughts for closing out our session here. Any final thoughts you want to tell us to buckle up our seatbelts to get what are we going to see in the next year or two years? Or are we going to look back at this at fondly as a time when we quaintly thought of it as an additional tool, online learning as an additional tool? What give us give us sort of food for thought so that we're prepared for what's coming? Yeah, I'll tell you what, from a corporate perspective, in the article that I wrote for the journal, I was suspect that certain categories would survive whenever there was an economic downturn, like education as a benefit, for example. I had my concerns. I think actually, I've uh, based on what I've seen so far, I actually think education as a benefit is going to be a much bigger category and have more durability than I thought for two reasons. One, uh, uh, companies are seeing that uh, when, when they've invested in, in employees through the benefit, uh, you can't take it away once you've given it. So you may have fewer employees, but you're actually not going to take away the benefit. Uh, and second, that they're actually doing way more measurement of return on investment in that category than I realized. So that education as a benefit is not just sort of this nice to have frill, but it's actually becoming a strategic uh, expenditure by many large employers. So I actually expect that category uh, to grow uh, in the years ahead. So I think companies like Guild Education that are facilitating that and the universities that are on those platforms uh, will be serving many, many more large employers uh, in the months and years ahead. And I, I, I frankly actually don't think it's going to retreat uh, nearly as much as what I said in the article. Okay, well, there you go. That's a very interesting update. Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. We have a million more questions, but we'll continue to follow your work. And uh, thanks for giving us uh, insights today. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Joining us now are Tucker Marion and Sebastian Fixon.
and we're going to have a conversation that should feel quite well connected to the one we just concluded. We're going to talk about the skills that the innovation workforce will need. Um, so, Sebastian, I see you have joined us on camera, and we can give um, Tucker just a second to uh, to join us as well. Well, good morning, Paul. Thanks for having us. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. And, well, and thank Paul, you. I, uh, my microphone is on. For some reason, my camera says it's on. Hopefully, that will come back in a second. So, and Tucker, we can hear you well. So, um, so that's great. Um, so let me let me do some quick introductions. Tucker uh, J. Marion is an associate professor of technological entrepreneurship at Northeastern University's Damore McKim School of Business, and Sebastian K. Fixen is associate dean of innovation and the Marla M. Capozzi MBA 96 Term Chair of Design, Thinking, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship at Babson College. And Sebastian, that is quite a title. Um, so in your, in your recent work, you've identified four skills that the innovation workforce will need to compete and succeed in the fourth industrial revolution. And we'll get into a specific conversation of each of those skills in just a bit, but let's do a little uh, stage setting first. And, and Tucker, maybe I, I can begin with you. Um, can you give the audience just a quick definition of what we mean by the fourth industrial revolution and how it will change the nature of work? Sure. Uh, well, if, if we look at over the last 15 years, the changes in digital communication technology, uh, changes in culture with collaboration, uh, that were able to, to access and use that, that change in technology, combined with changes in how we can design and make things. So the propagation of all sorts of design tools that enable changes in the way uh, teams can design physical products and also software, and also how those things can be constructed. And, you know, this has really come to the point where uh, you know, companies that are leveraging these sorts of things uh, can proceed the tasks and the organization that runs those activities uh, can have profound changes on it. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, as we've seen with changes of the other types of, of changes of during the Industrial Revolution, starting in the 1800s to today, we're in a period of massive dynamic change. And of course, now we're thrown into you know, another, another massive change over the last month or two. Uh, and you know, it's it's really we like uh, uh, Sebastian and I have kind of coined the term uh, for this particular instance is somewhat of a perfect storm of, of the collabor these changes in tools, the way we can work, and how the, how that might mean for changes and how we actually do the activities of, of developing new innovation. Well, that's great, and I, and I want to um, I want to come back to the kind of particular environment that we are all struggling with right now in just a second. But let's set that aside for a moment. Um, com in comparison with other kind of major waves or the preceding three waves um, of the Industrial Revolution, help us understand the gap between where we are now relative to where we need to be this time versus the last three. Sebastian, do you want to take that one? Sure. <clears throat> I think maybe as a little piece of background, even though Tucker and I work both on business schools, we are by training originally engineers. So lots of our studies in the innovation activities and processes looked at people who do technical work. And in particular, over the last 15 years, we looked into the fact of digital tools. And the one thing, Paul, to answer your question, we noticed is that um, in, in the past, often tools simply increased, well, simply increased the productivity, right? Allow people to do more and better outputs. And I think what we notice now is that the digital tools um, allow people to do very different things. It allows people to do, um, to design and invent very different solutions. Um, it also allows more people to enter the innovation activities, so changes the competitive landscape. So we feel, and what we found in our studies is that um, not only the process itself gets accelerated, but it has impacted the innovation work, which then led us to distilling these four skills that were in the article as sort of the key points that we think needs to need the skills need to be acquired by us initially studying technical people, but I think it's more broadly true for everyone. 
Well, so let's move into the four skills. Let's get let's get into the gritty, and we'll kind of we'll kind of dive in and out um, during this conversation. Let me let me I will tee them up, and and whoever uh, between the two of you wants to take each one, please feel free. The first is my favorite, um, and this would have my daughter rolling her eyes. Omniscience. Sure. Uh, well, you know, based on the the research that we've done, and and what you can, well, number one, we've seen so many changes in, in how we can actually approach the activities of work, right? So we know that. And this is changing so rapidly that a tool you might have used five years ago is irrelevant today, and we might have something pop up tomorrow. Uh, given that, and combined with the complexity of the businesses that are leveraging these tools, that it requires really a, a very high level of systems thinking and how you approach uh, the design and development and commercialization of things. So I'll give an example. In the article, we discuss a, a, a medical device company. And traditionally, in traditional R&D, yes, you might have a, a, you know, a patient need and you develop a particular device that solves uh, One of the chief innovation leaders of the company that we're speaking with is, no, actually, what we need to do is a much higher level view of starting with patient outcomes and working all the way back. And that means we need to understand everything from treatment uh, through the actual procedure itself, to the device, to all the way to the beginning of that particular technology development deep inside an R&D organization. And how do you knit together all those individuals, all those different ways that you're touching those actors within that process? Uh, and it really requires kind of a, a very holistic sense of not only the tools, that you're using, but how you interface with all of the actors along and stakeholders along that value chain, uh, and how that ultimately impacts the performance of whatever system you're developing. So it requires, you know, a very broad set of skills, the ability to learn new things very quickly, uh, and you know, it's it's one of those things that one that one that we're seeing a need and and the skill development was what Michael talked about earlier is that in our traditional method of teaching business and engineering we're still very siloed and we need to go up many many levels to develop those sorts of skills and so in your description of omniscience we're not really talking about an individual skill as much as that would be something but a collective skill correct yes well a collective suite of skills so it may be technical it may be uh, business related, uh, ethical, as we mentioned, as one of the, the points in the article, and really to be able to knit together these different types of characteristics uh, that you have to bring to the table in order to deal with the complexity of, of the products and services that are, that are needed today. Thank you. The second skill on your list is certainly a more familiar one, and that's an entrepreneurial mindset. Now, let, let me take this one. Um, and in our research, again, what we initially studied were people being in the act of innovations, right? So what, what we noticed is that um, increase, with the increasing volatility of the environment and the teams trying to um, chart unknown waters, that it clear to us that what they needed to do is to develop often their own solutions. And that led, obviously, in established organizations to all kinds of conflicts can we use a new software that hasn't been approved by our IT group? Can we pull in outsiders that, whose expertise we need? All these kinds of questions. And what I think what we realized is to be successful in this environment, um, employees need to be acting a lot more um, with an entrepreneurial mindset, focusing, as Michael also mentioned earlier, as well as Scott in the first talk that you had, um, that the focus is on learning. But the learning needs to be sort of structured and organized by the teams themselves, because if they don't, if it's unknown to the large organization what the path is, the team has to find its path forward. So it needs to develop the skill set and the mindset, which is sort of an attitude question, um, to try to figure things out for themselves in a much, much quicker way than many processes and established organizations typically allow. And to follow on, as to give an example of that, uh, we spend some time with a, a local Boston company that you wouldn't think would be as high tech as it as it is, uh, and they 
have really reshaped and reformed their R&D organization to focus on you know, a, a digital group. And this digital group actually went out and developed their own artificial intelligence software package uh, for generative design uh, to help the teams do that. Uh, and they, they did it internally. They didn't purchase a piece of software. They actually developed the code themselves. And that is really a unique piece of intellectual property uh, that they've developed. And they're seeing that as the core of, of their business going forward is, is, is to maximize the capability of that internal digital group. And maybe, maybe more broadly, even though the article focuses on skills of the employees, there's office the flip side, um, what the role of the company is in this situation, right? And in the book that Parker and I um, published last year, in which we lay out the innovation landscape and to four modes, as we call them, one of them is labeled venture mode. And that is exactly asking the companies to create an environment in which employees then can articulate and express their entrepreneurial um, mindset and activities. Uh, thank you. I'm gonna once we're done talking about the other two skills, I want to I want to actually pursue that thread a little bit a, a little bit further. Um, but let's let's stay on let's stay on our role and move to the um, to the third skill you identify, which is ever more familiar and not exactly new, and that's a bottom line focus. Sure, uh, I'll take this. So I think that one of the things, and, and of course the the world that we're dealing with now is that's more important than ever as you have Ford projected to lose $2 billion in this quarter alone and to think about how that's going to change businesses such as that. Uh, what we want to do in the article is, is to, to push to really think about uh, how using these the different ways that we can communicate, collaborate, develop things, how that can actually push you to really improve a focus on the bottom line. And that could be new products, it could be new services. In the article, we talk about uh, an example of developing a digital twin. And one of the, the companies that we worked with very closely uh, with this was uh, an individual within an organization that was charged with really maximizing the use and showing the benefit of, of using digital twins, ultimately leading to a wide array of brand new services and features within the product that could be monetized in a different way. And, and because this individual was, was an omniscient thinker, so to speak, and, and really thinking about the entire system and how to leverage this new technology, that it ultimately led to the potential of brand new sources of revenue for not only the company itself producing the software, but also the companies using this to design their products and services. And uh, it was very apparent that, that those individuals and organizations that can leverage this really open up lots of opportunities uh, for really reshaping their business. One of the example companies uh, that we use is a, is a Canadian company called Dental Wings, which has really rethought the end-to-end -end business of, of dental implants. And it's, it's really a unique case. I think, Paul, you mentioned it shouldn't be surprising that the bottom line focus is an important skill. Um, I mean, one way to think about this is that, of course, business leaders and executives always have this in mind. But I think what we're arguing for is that um, that is another argument against the siloing of the st structures, that more people understand what their part is into the larger business models, and especially with the changes from business models from product to services. Um, a lot of the technical skills that used to be focused on improving a particular technical performance need to understand the relationship of what they do to the ultimate customer outcome and therefore to the success of the business model. So in some sense, the argument is that the employees on a broader level need to understand much more about how the business works and why it works as a business, how they can contribute to new business models. Thank you. And the fourth, um, fourth skill you identify maybe not quite as familiar, um, certainly not as a phrase, and that's ethical intelligence. Sebastian, do you want to begin with this one? Sure. I mean, neither Tucker nor I are experts in um, the subject of ethics. However, just as the digitization drove a number of forces that we identified creating the requirements for the skills one through three, I think the um, Examples all around us with data breaches, um, misinformation, et cetera, 
the challenges with AI and its interpretability of the results, all of that suggests to us that yes, we want to use the digital tools, we as a society, as employees, as organizations, but with it comes an enormous amount of responsibility. So we think in the organizations, <clears throat> we need to have mechanisms to raise certain questions, to force certain discussions into the open, to enable people to ask certain questions. Um, I think one of the earlier speakers talked about psychological safety in terms of productivity and innovation and allowing creative ideas to emerge. I think the same is true for critical questions. Um, to not to avoid certain disasters that at least in an exemplary level we already have witnessed is that this technology can, does come with some challenges. And so both on the individual level as well as an organizational level, we feel um, processes that reminds us to ask certain questions, give us the permission to ask the questions are really critical. Thank you. So if you were if you were writing the article today, would the skills be the same? Um, and meaning I'm speaking in, 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 in particular about kind of life in the pandemic and what we can expect in the social and economic aftermath for some time to come. Um, would the list stay the same? And, and if so, do any of these skills carry more or less weight? given this dramatically changed environment? Well, that's a great question. I think that how we approach the article is really to think forward uh, in time and what will be increasingly important in the future. And I think that the future in some ways has accelerated uh, very quickly. So I don't think that we would necessarily change some of the skills that we talked about, but as, as you had mentioned, uh, there are some that we might you know, amplify. And I think that, let's say, one of them might be the entrepreneurial skill portion of that, because we, even in our daily activities, we're trying to figure out the best way to use Slack, or uh, how do we even show ourselves on Teams or Zoom? Do we have a background? Do we not? How do we deal with, with individuals and students that may not have access? So we're, even in these very small activities, we're trying to figure out new ways to do things. And I think that is a skill that that we might emphasize a little more uh, if we were to write that article today. Very good. Yeah, as Please. the earlier conversations this morning suggested, what COVID-19 primarily has done is accelerating the, the uncertainty and volatility of our environment, right? So all the skills that are helpful in navigating in a more uncertain, more volatile environment are certainly helpful. And I think the entrepreneurial mindset for all of us is, is um, absolutely necessary, right? As Tucker said, um, we as instructors, as professors, have to find new ways to work with them. It's true for all um, other functions in our schools. I mean, Michael drew a very interesting picture of what may happen to a number of schools going forward. And I think it behooves us to be as entrepreneurial as everybody else needs to be. So we're getting lots of great questions from our audience, and I'm going to begin incorporating some of those. Sure. Is the development um, of these skills a, a workforce problem or a company problem? I think that it's a question about responsibility. And are companies even able to articulate what they expect to need from their workforces right now? Well, I think it, it, to, to add some comments to that question. It's a great question, by the way. I think that we need to look at this as multiple levels. I think that, number one, there's an individual level, that that if you empower yourself to try to think about improving your own skills, that, that's that's the kind of the first level. The second would be organizational. So there's impact on how do, how do we train employees? Uh, what's the most effective way to do that? And also, how does this impact the actual organization design? You know, do we, do we add, uh, you know, the ability to have self-selected entrepreneurial teams? Do we change the scope and, and of, of the different department structure and business units? And then I think the third level would be overall, uh, how do we think about changing the workforce itself uh, through higher education, through incentives? Uh, uh, maybe potentially, is there, does the government play a role or state governments play a role in helping to try to drive these skills? So I, I think that there, there are multiple levels and lenses that you can look at this. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, 
what is the level of urgency we should feel? And I think that the underlying question here is, is the need for the skills you've identified universal across industry? Is everyone on the same timeline or depending on your function or industry or role? Um, you know, should, should we feel more or less urgency? That's a very interesting question. Um, I think my, my quick answer would be no matter the industry you're in, right? And so the, the general need to build these skills and more of these, I think, is true across the board. It's probably true that some industries have different clock speeds, to use uh, Charlie Fine's term. And those who are slower due to government regulations or some other um, forces that slower their cycle might have a bit more time than those that change much faster. Um, but I, um, in the spirit of the theme of disruption today, I, I think there isn't any industry who should um, be complacent of thinking, well, it won't happen to us. So. Very good. Um, let's see what's next. Um, if I'm in, you know, I, I think there's there's a lot of interest in, you know, what do we do with these insights, right? So you, you you've identified, I think, quite clearly these skills and their value. Um, but if I'm an organizational development or organizational learning leader, um, and I'm certain there are quite a few people who fit that description in our audience. How do I move forward? How do I take these skills and take that first step, right? And I think maybe we only talked about the first step today, towards a broad kind of learning plan or skill development plan for my organization. Want to take that one, Sebastian? Yeah, sure. So um, I think there are two major avenues to think about. Well, one is if it's a skill set that you think needs outside training or some form of expertise, um, whether it's um, professional uh, learning companies or higher education institutions like ours, um, there are ways to find support. But I think the other one is, and we are increasingly thinking about this ourselves, is this notion of learning by doing, right? And so, or what organizations can do themselves, and again, I don't, um, we, we talk about this in our book, is if you create an environment that enables people to develop these skills while doing their work, or some of these skills at least, um, you basically kill two birds with one stone. And also the learning might sit, um, the, the learning might be more um, integrated in people's work life and therefore is, um, is easier to retrieve and has more impact on their life. So in other words, I think the learning and development officer needs to be more integrated or more connected to the work that happens in the organization instead of being only a separate entity that offers some training and in certain intervals or cadences. Oftentimes when organizations are kind of undertaking broad cultural transformation, and I think development of these, score, of these skills is likely to qualify along those lines, they're able to identify kind of people who are exemplary of where the organization needs to go in the future. Any thoughts on how organizations can identify the members of their workforce who might be further along um, in development of some of the required skills? Sure, I think that <clears throat> from, you know, organizations are you you if you have an executive team that is interested in changing and transformation that's one thing and we've seen you know from the from the innovation management literature perspective over many decades you know it's 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 almost that's the easy part is that you have an executive team trying to push the organization in a certain way and that can be effective that's certainly valuable but in in the case of some very famous companies that have uh, gone away is that you may have multiple changes of, of executive teams doing that, but, but you have this amorphous middle, so to speak, that, that some research has talked about, and trying to change the culture can be very, very difficult. So if you're gonna identify individuals that would be innovation champions, so to speak, I think that uh, number one, you, you look at their willingness to, to be leaders within that particular 
within that particular middle of the organization, how empowered uh, they are, uh, how willingness they are to learn new skills, how willing they are to take risk and to fail. And, and those, and there may not be a lot of them, but there certainly will be a subset of those individuals. And those individuals should be tasked with trying to think about ways that we can implement uh, you know, new skills in the organization and propagate that from the, the bottom or the middle out through the organization. I think that's really the most effective way of, of trying to change culture. And, and there are a number of different examples from firms that have done that successfully. Well, what I would add is that in addition to identifying the, the exemplars, as you call them, um, I think one of the big consequences is when you ask your employee base to behave more entrepreneurial, you have to let them do that. And so that means for the leadership that the entire power structure um, will change. And this is easy, much, much easier said than done. Um, if, if, if you want not only a few examples, but broader sections of your employees to behave more entrepreneurially, you will have to give them more you will have to give them and decide. So that probably requires a whole new requires a whole new structure as well as power structure. And including incentives and, and one and one is this can take a long time. Uh, even though we have to change even though we have to change the mindset where where we may not change within six months, six months we want to keep at it for a see that change in your excuse me. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, a, a question for either of you, although although Sebastian, it's directed uh, towards you. Um, is Peter Senge's model of the learning organization still valid? Well, I think as many speakers this morning suggested that the act of learning itself is indeed one of the critical elements to survive in any um, uncertain environment. Uh, I mean, Peter's model is what now about 30 years old. And I think it was very, very insightful. It was formulated before the digital age, if you will. So I could see elements of being being updated, but the general insight as an organization needs to learn to survive, I think, still holds true. Yes. Great. And a final question um, that either of you can feel free to answer. Um, connecting this conversation, this excellent conversation, with the one that preceded it, what is the role of organized education to address these skill gaps? Do, what kind of collaboration is required between corporate, corporate and, um, and academia? Well, I'll just, I'll just give a quick uh, couple of sentences and then Sebastian. But I, I think that we need to see much closer integration between the needs of corporations and what we are developing as as the workers of the future. That is, for me, that's absolutely paramount. I don't think that we do a good enough job today. Uh, and and actually related to this, we we there's a, a huge educational aspect to these four skills that we don't really touch upon in the article that, that needs to be addressed. And I think that and uh, in, in relating to the last discussion, I think we all will be experimenting with different ways to develop these sorts of skills for organizations. But the key to that is really understanding uh, what the organizations need going forward. And Sebastian, I don't want to add to that. Well, Paul, I think that's a discussion for another half an hour at least. But let me give you a 30 <laughs> second answer. I think um, what we identified as the skills here initially focused on employees, but collectively for organizations, the same is true for application. I think we need to be much more integrated, as Tucker said, with our customer and our customers' customers. I think the field of higher education will become far more diverse, homogenic as it is now, homogenous, um, and it will change. So the speed will accelerate and change. And so that means we need to change faster. And we will. Sebastian Tucker, thank you very much for a terrific conversation.
Our next guest is Joshua Gans. Joshua is the Jeffrey S. School Chair of Technical Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the University of Toronto's Rotman School of Management. And we have a very interesting question on the table with Joshua. The question is to disrupt or not to disrupt. Joshua, welcome to our symposium. Hi, it's good to be here. As you know, Clay uh, thought an, a great question was even more important than a great answer because framing the questions properly was uh, the best way to actually get to new and better insights. So you've asked a question, you know, to disrupt or not to disrupt. Your article makes the point that disruption is a choice. What do you mean by that? Well, uh, the reason it's not a question that I ask and answer. It is a question that any uh, startup firm should ask themselves, uh, whether they want to be a disruptor or, or not a disruptor. Um, I'm getting distracted by my buffering webcam. So, you know, we're getting disrupted right here, to, whether I want it <laughs> or not. Uh, so uh, the issue uh, uh, is, is the traditional picture of a, of a disruptor is there's an industry that sort of stayed in its ways, hasn't changed very much for some period of time. Uh, and then it basically ends up uh, uh, going. Um, uh, you know, there's an opportunity that, that uh, emerges because of uh, uh, some things. Uh, and uh, essentially, uh, the issue is that, so you've got a state industry, uh, a startup firm comes in and uh, the idea is they apply this new technology that incumbents there are slow to get into. Uh, and they do it with a view to uh, shaking things up. Uh, the point I make, however, in my article is that uh, you can bring a new technology to an industry, but whether you choose to shake up that industry or try to find a path whereby existing firms in that industry would adopt that technology and its practices are uh, two different things. And so, you know, every startup, uh, I've come across uh, hundreds uh, from my work with the Creative Destruction Lab here at the University of Toronto. Every startup is, uh, has that same set of choices. And so we don't see it as, oh, there's only one way to be a startup. And, and I think some of the earlier literature on disruptive innovation tended to think that way. Oh, only disruptors make it. Uh, that's actually not, not, not true at all. Um, in fact, uh, the article opens with a, a case from 20 years ago where that wasn't true. Uh, that was the case where the technological opportunity was online, uh, uh, e-commerce had come into being, and different startups had the idea that you would be able to uh, order your groceries online. Uh, as a result of that, um, uh, two different startups, the point two came into being. One was Webvan, and Webvan, was the disruptive mode. Webvan said, oh, e-commerce is here. People need to get groceries to their house. Why do we need these supermarkets anymore? We should just get rid of them. Uh, they're costly, they're expensive. We can deliver everything cheaper to consumers without uh, going through that. The uh, second part of it was, um, could I turn my, you know, <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting questions in the middle of this. Uh, I'm, unfortunately, without disengaging uh, for, uh, entirely uh, and coming back in, I can't do anything. Uh, so tell me if you want me to do that. Uh, so uh, Webvan uh, uh, wanted to get rid of supermarkets entirely. Uh, another startup at the same time had the same basic idea using e-commerce to order groceries, and that was called Peapod. And what they did was they sent shoppers down to the supermarkets uh, to do shopping on your behalf. Now, that was an activity that's more costly than you going yourself. Um, but uh, it was, um, it was uh, something that allowed supermarkets to take advantage of the uh, new developments 
but supermarkets would still exist. Now, we know what happened there. What happened there was that uh, Webvan burned through a billion dollars of cash and went bankrupt uh, less than a year after its IPO. Peapod ended up doing quite well and then became a fully owned subsidiary of Our Hold, uh, which owns Shop and Stop. So Webvan and Peapod, uh, they were two different firms. They produced markedly different strategies. In that particular instance, the one pursuing the disruptive strategy to wipe out the incumbent firms was in fact, uh, uh, did in fact uh, not, not succeed. Um, in, in this particular, but in other cases, it can be very different, such as in, in, uh, in book selling, it was very different. Book selling, uh, it was, uh, there were, Amazon wasn't the first uh, online book selling. Uh, in fact, uh, what happened was there were some other ones called, uh, there's one called Bookstack and other ones like that, that actually partnered with existing books uh, stores and were doing these sort of uh, Peapod type thing. Um, and then Amazon decided to go over the top of all of that. Uh, and we know which one won out there. Uh, so the point I make in the article is it's very much a choice. It's not obvious which way is the right way to go. It may never be obvious which way the right way to go is. Um, so you have you, but the point is that you, as an entrepreneur, have options, and so that's really the theme I'm trying to push. So how do you then consider those options? I, I definitely want to get us to talking about now in current context, but let's take what you wrote about in the article in SMR. Uh, how do you then make a decision about which path to take, which options to take, as you're thinking about uh, being an entrepreneur and, and starting up? Well, the way uh, I would uh, do that is, uh, uh, and it's a way that myself and Scott Stern and Erin Scott have been writing a textbook about, and that is that you should, whenever you're formulating a, a business plan or a strategy for your startup, you should not formulate just one business plan. Oh, I'm going to be Uber for dog grooming. Um, because that already sort of binds you into not only a, a path, but a set of who your customers are going to be, what technology you're going to use, what organization you're going to have, et cetera. Uh, instead, what you should do is you should basically formulate two business plans. <laughs> you should outline, if I'm going to be a disruptor, what should my business look like? What are the things I should emphasize? What should I, who sh which customers should I target? It? Who is my real competition? And if I'm not going to be a disruptor, uh, and I'm going to try and say slot myself into the value chain, uh, as Peapod did, um, then who am I going to be cooperating with? What sort of relationships do I have to build? That sort of thing. And those are very two very different business plans. And for many entrepreneurs, even uh, when formulating those two business plans, it won't be obvious which one to go, and it'll end up being a, a you know something akin to a gut choice or maybe something that you know their investors tend to favor, or maybe they never saw themselves as anything other than a disruptor, so it's gonna be disrupting. But we encourage it's, it's, people to do two business plans, yeah. So, okay, let's talk about that. So you encourage them to do two business plans. What, what are the significant differences between option A and option B in terms of how you do the business plan? Well, the, the differences come on four different uh, sets of choices that you have to make for any startup. The first choice you'd have is your choice of who's going to be your target initial customer. You have to, you know, startups have to start somewhere. You can't so easily start with the world. You have to say, what's my customer going to look like? Um, and you could actually see these choices play out in the web van versus the Peapod ads. The web van ads were all about how horrible it is to go to a supermarket. So they were targeting people who didn't like going to the supermarket. And they were betting on that being everybody. Um, uh, where's Peapod, who are they targeting? Well, if you look back at the ads there, they were targeting basically working professionals or in particular working women professionals. People who were tasked with doing the shopping but didn't have time to do it. Um, so there's very different customers being, being, being targeted there. One was sort of a premium customer, time poor working professionals. The other was very mass market customer. So those are two distinct groups where to start your business and you right down to the ads, we'll choose different things for those. The other um, 
the other set of technology uh, set of choices is the second set is your choice of technology and by what we mean is sort of how you go about your business um with 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 uh, say webvan if you're going to make this work that you're going to deliver all these groceries to people at very low cost your technology is going to emphasize logistics it's going to emphasize being able to have a distribution network that is able to farm out to individual homes and react quickly. Whereas for Peapod, your technology is going to be, well, I've got to train these shoppers to go down and how do I make sure they make the right calls on what people actually want to have? It's actually quite a difficult problem. Very different technology. So you have a, a, a different choices there. Your third choice that you have differently is, of course, who's your competition? So with Webvan, it was like everybody. Well, it was all the supermarkets. They were their competition. They were out to get them. With uh, with Peapod, on the other hand, that definitely wasn't their competition. They needed the supermarkets and they needed them to do well. Their competition was uh, people who wanted to, rather than buy their service, go to the supermarket themselves. <laughs> so it's kind of like their own potential customers. And there's nothing wrong with that. So your comp choice of competition is different. And then finally, your choice of organization. Your choice of organization is you as a startup firm can't do everything. So you have to prioritize what you're going to be good at. And in many ways that follows from all those other choices. With Webvan, it was gonna to have to be logistics and getting things at low cost. With Peapod, it was gonna to have to be making sure that when people, you did shopping on somebody's behalf, they were happier with that outcome than going to the store themselves. And by the way, that's a huge problem. I mean. Today, Instacart still faces that problem uh, and other things like that. You really have to, you know, this is a, a thing that's very difficult to solve. So those are the four choices. And so you have to build out a plan addressing all of those. Uh, and they can be quite distinct depending on whether you're intending to disrupt or not. Joshua, is one path or the other more difficult if you're just if you're deciding based on your business plan A or business plan B that you do want to be a disruptor? If you have a good answer for three of your four questions, is that good enough? Or is being a disruptor, it's all in, all those things have to work, or you should consider taking the, the, the value chain path? You have to, no, 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 no. Um, you have to make those choices for everything you've got. You have to make those choices for everything you've got. So you're making those choices whether you think about it or not. And if you don't think about it, you'll probably make them badly. The key thing about being a disruptor or being value chain and getting it all right is making sure those choices make sense with each other, uh, that they're somewhat compatible. I mean, if, 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 if Webvan said, we're going after everybody, but we're not going to emphasize logistics, that would be stupid. <laughs> um, so you have to sort of have these things match. So some of the, where you start is of course another matter. Most people start with the customer they're trying to target. But some people uh, start with the competition, who they really want to get <laughs> as the motivating thing and sort of building all this out. Um, and, and so it doesn't really matter. Uh, that's up to the individual entrepreneur, but eventually you've got to go through all those four choices. You've got to make a call on each of them, and then you've got to separately Oops, have I lost everyone again? Have I lost you again? Are you back? Oh, I'm, I'm back. Here? Sorry. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. The whole existential thing. I don't know if I, I know. exist sorry. in the world. Sorry. It's a. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> anyway. Limitations. Um, I'm going right. to ask you a question. I don't know we have why a lot of audience there. questions. We have a lot of audience Wait. questions. I'm going to try to throw okay. them at you. They're, they're all over the place, but they're they're good ones. So I'm going to. I'm just going to go for it. To disrupt or not to disrupt? How about the importance of small scale testing of your choices hypothesis? All, venture, uh, all uh, ventures have to test. Um, they've just got different hypotheses. So let's think about if you choose to be a disruptor, you have to have a hypothesis of how you're going to create value for the customers you choose and a hypothesis of how you're going to capture that value. So to be a disruptor, you've got to make sure is, you know, are you going to create value? Am I going to be able to deliver the quality that people expect, which might be lower than current quality, the quality they expect uh, at a at a cost that is as is, is is low enough. That's that's the hypothesis. 
And so I have to test that hypothesis. And one way I test that is see if I can, I can do it through, say, a minimum viable product or something like that. The second hypothesis you also have to have is, am I going to make any money doing this? So if I have this great new product and I'm satisfying these consumers and delivering it, well, if the incumbents all wake up and then crush me, well, that's not going to be that too good. So I have to have a hypothesis there. If I'm a disruptor, I'm going to intend to make money out of it. Then the incumbents are going to have to be sluggish. That's a little harder to test, by the way. Uh, it's hard to test because uh, the incumbents, uh, you know, if they if you wake the kraken, uh, you're going you're in big trouble. Now, so what a lot of uh, disruptive strategies have is that they try it out on a niche market first that the incumbents aren't paying much attention to, and then see if those hypotheses hold, and then they try to scale up from there. But you have to have test hypothesis in any any training. If you're not going to be a disruptor, you still have to do it. I mean, it may be that if you found out as web fan that no one wants to pay a premium to have somebody go do shopping on your behalf, or they just can't do it well enough. Uh, and it proves that more frustrating, you know, that's a hypothesis that you're testing when running that startup. So you're not going to roll this out across the country to do that. You're going to run it in a locality first to see if you can really deliver that. So all startups involve hypotheses. One or the other doesn't, doesn't matter. So Webvan may have been 20 years ahead of its time, right? Because right now we might have been uh, grateful for, for that. Let, let's talk about well, we how it. We it. Uh, the current... Just to mention, we got it. Webvan's assets ended up being acquired by Amazon, and Amazon is essentially what Webvan was. <laughs> For so much more, right? So maybe that was that was a a beta maybe. test, and and it got so yeah. We all rely, completely rely on it. Well, let's talk about what, what do we know now? And talking about the uncertainty and, and doing plans is very very difficult. I would imagine to to plan anything right now. What what do you think the current environment does to someone thinking about Plan A, Plan B, Choice A, Choice B. What are we, what are we going to see, and, and how do they need to think differently? Well, I've done a lot of thinking about that, and let, let's go to plugging mode uh, tomorrow. MIT Press, the or, uh, publisher of this fine journal, uh, Sloan Management Review, is publishing my book, Economics in the Age of COVID-19, uh, and okay. uh, it goes through a lot of the uh, issues that. Uh, facing, including uh, innovation. So I've just sent that into the chat. I don't know if that goes, or maybe, that, maybe I can send it to everybody um, <laughs> somehow. Uh, uh, so, so everybody can see the link for that, economics in the age of COVID-19. But it's really true. Um, whatever's going on now is going to have a big impact on how we think about innovation. So let me give you some principles associated with that. If you're going to launch a venture, that is, so, so there are two sorts of ventures and technological opportunities that have been opened up by our current disaster. The, if you imagine the world has currently got a whole lot of activities that have been moved from what we would call an unrestricted bucket, where people could just do them freely, to a restricted bucket where you can't. And so what does that mean? That means that there's two opportunities. One opportunity is we can make this stuff in the restricted bucket, as we're currently trying to do here, better. And obviously there is room for improvement, we can see right now. We can make that better. <laughs> um, and so there will be innovations like that. And some of those innovations were previous, uh, uh, I guess go to meeting here and, and uh, Zoom and others uh, helping us being able to work from home, those sorts of things. Uh, but there'll be, there may well be more of that. Uh, of how, how to do that. I, I believe some people would be, would, would look very uh, favorably on a device that was a mute button for children. Anyhow, <laughs> so you could imagine a lot of innovations that could be predicated on making it easy to work from home. And who knows how long we're going to be doing that, but it could be upwards of uh, 12 to 18 months. Other innovations uh, could be how do we get make it safe for us to move activities out of that restricted bucket and put them into the unrestricted bucket. And so those are innovations that make it less likely that you'll infect people by those businesses. So we can imagine whole lots of protective gear, we can have testing, we can imagine all sorts of things, sterilization, et cetera. There's a raft of stuff. And at the Creative Destruction Lab, we are trying to encourage ventures 
uh, along those lines uh, who are going to be able to do those things to take things that are currently dangerous and make them safe. And so those are the two uh, technological opportunities in the current environment. But here's the thing. Those opportunities are going to be really bad businesses if things work out well in the world. <laughs> <laughs> It turns out that the virus can be contained and it goes away quickly and it isn't as fatal as we thought and isn't as damaging, etc. Your business is based on COVID-19 at toast. On the other hand, if it turns out to be much worse than expected, uh, those businesses are going to do really well. Now, that's a very, very morbid way of looking at the world. I, I realize that, but it makes it no less true. Um, the good news, the only comforting thing I can say about that is you know, if you launch a business and it turns out to be uh, the good outcome for the world, well, you know, that's just good. You should just feel happy that it was the good outcome for the world. <laughs> you launch a business and the world is much worse. Well, you're helping, helping making it a little less worse. I like that thinking, actually. I think that's sort of a win-win, although uh, it will be very interesting to see uh, what opportunities arise in the next, you know, 18, 18 months, two years. Is there uh, advice you would give a company that doesn't fit into that category? And I hope I'm back because I'm getting uh, winked out. Um, I hope that answers that question. <laughs> unless I've been kicked off entirely. Joshua, it's Paul, we can still hear you. Oh, you can still hear me, okay, good. Okay, all right, I'm ready for the next question. Sorry, my bad. Oh, Karen has no sound. <laughs> I, I went down. Me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Joshua. I went down. I was just saying any sort of pearls of wisdom for a company or, or, or aspiring entrepreneur who doesn't fall into that category of potentially oh. saving the world, making the world a safer place. What, what, what else can they think about so that the world doesn't pass them by in the next 18 months or two years? You, you know, innovation takes time. <laughs> so the chances are for most stuff. that the world opens up in 12 to 18 months and you, and you are ready to go. I mean, look, people, there are a lot of people trying to look for things to, to do. Um, and, so, and, and, and a lot of the activities that we are hoping will be there straight into the future. Look, if you are launching a business that is gonna do great uh, in, uh, in, in movie cinemas, like a new form of popcorn for movie cinemas that you're trying to distribute it that way, that's not gonna be great now. But if you, on the other <laughs> hand, uh, you know, in biotechnology or you're offering new work tools or any other things that you were doing previously, if you were in AI, it's business as usual. What's the big difference? Um, you know, not a lot of our businesses have been innovating that are critically dependent on people being out, able to be out and about. So that's the good news. The other great news is that money is cheap at the moment, dirt cheap. Um, you know, a lot of countries are actually putting up money to help startups go through these environments. So there, there, there is opportunity there. Not only that, there's a whole lot of developers and other things that are currently out of work or not able to do their stuff and you can hire them. So, you know, this is one of those situations where it, it's kind of seems bleak, but, but if you sort of sit down and sit back, you can work a way through. It is, it, it is, it is possible to do that. Let, let me thank you for that. Let me ask you one more viewer question because uh, we've got a lot and uh, I will uh, I'll have to cherry pick because there's so many here. How about this one? How do you disrupt a traditional cast in stone model such as lockstep partnership driven old world law firms? Uh, the legal service industry is ripe for disruption. I believe that's true. Uh, if only we could find the right set of tools and inject fresh thinking. So how, how do you think about disrupting when it's not a, a product, well, it's not a service? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a, that's interesting. I've seen a lot of legal tech firms, and legal tech firms are very interesting. They, you know, for instance, these AI ones that can automate things and dramatically bring down the cost of of. You know, the problem with that is that they're selling to the law firms, uh, which is good. 
Yeah, well, which is a, which is uh, nothing wrong with that. Uh, and the law firms are keeping the margins <laughs> that are going on. There. Right, very right. Good. They're very good at that. They're very good at that. So the world tells us that that is in a sustainable situation. So, but what is going to happen? The question is really whether the law firms remain a bottleneck or not. Um, and, you know, they've got good chance. They've got a good chance to do that. <laughs> they've done very well for, for a long, long period of time. Um, but, you know, you see some, you know, some of the functions, wills, uh, contracts, real estate contracts, all sorts of things starting to move out of that. My message, and I wrote a previous book, uh, also published by MIT Press called The Disruption Dilemma, is that, you know, the fact that something's been an incumbent for a long period of time is not a signal that they're ripe for disruption. It's a signal that they have something <laughs> that is very hard to disrupt. That's what the takeaway from that is. And even though you can see a lot of things that look like waste, et cetera, that doesn't mean they, they still don't have something that is essential. And so it's not clear it's all going to go in your favor. It's not clear that it's so easy to disrupt. Well, we have a lot more viewer questions. I'm afraid we don't have time for them, but I among I, so I assume a large part of this audience will be looking forward to your book tomorrow. I really would I'm really interested to know where you see uh, the opportunity and how economics play out in COVID-19. Joshua, sure. thank you for joining us today. Very grateful for your time and your thoughts and look forward to seeing what you have to say tomorrow. Thank you. I am now excited to welcome in Amy Webb. Hey there. Hi, Amy. Thanks so you? much for joining us. I'm doing really well. Thank um, you for having me. Um, indeed, and thank you for joining us. Let me give you a quick introduction. Amy is the founder of the Future Today Institute and professor of strategic foresight at the New York University Stern School of Business. And in this session, we are going to take on the 11 sources of disruption every company should monitor. And I do want to go through them kind of quickly one by one, um, but I do have an, open, an, an opening rather pressing question. Was the coronavirus one of them? <laughs> um, <laughs> yes and no, right? So what I would say is that, um, would I have known that a coronavirus at this particular moment in time would have caused this amount of disruption? No. I mean, there's no way to build that kind of a model using any available data. However, are pandemics something that everybody should always be thinking about? I mean, yes, right? Um, and the challenge, of course, is, and the promise of strategic foresight, you can't predict exactly when things over which you have very little control will happen, but you can create a state of readiness. And that's in, in fact, the entire point and professional role of a futurist is to create a state of readiness. And this 11 macro sources of disruption is one way to get started. Well, great. So let's let's work our way through them. Um, and we don't have to do kind of a, a lightning round um, version of this. We can spend up. You, you don't want to spend a, the next half hour of me just reading yeah. through all of them? <laughs> no, it's, it, it's quite the list. Um, and I kind of think about it. I mean, you, we, we, we call it in the article, we call it 11. Um, it, it, we might be better characterized as 10 plus one, but we'll, we'll get to that mm -hmm. in a second. But let's let's work our way through beginning with wealth distribution. Sure. So again, I think that, um, let me maybe back up really quickly. So this sort of, my, my colleague, Mark Palatucci likes to call it the wheel of disruption. Um, so picture, if you will, a circle, if you haven't seen this thing yet, um, a series of concentric circles. And in the middle of it is your organization, then goes technology, and then go these other sources of change. And this all stems back to the Future Today Institute's future forces theory, which really explains that disruption tends to stem from influential factors um, that combine together over which you have no singular control. Um, and a lot of times when organizations are trying to chart a path to the future, they tend to look only within their own industry. And the, the challenge of course, is that everything is so interconnected that what happens you know, in technology in some ways might have some influence over technology and in some weird way may portend huge changes on the horizon for the cold chain, right? So the trick is to use a framework to try to sort all of this out. So back to wealth distribution. 
So, um, you know, this goes beyond your sort of traditional economic indicators. What we're looking at is how does the emergence of some kind of macro force uh, or, or technology or whatever it might be, some change, if we, if we look at that through the lens of wealth distribution, where does that get to? So are we looking at uh, narrower or uh, wider gaps between haves and have-nots? Are we looking at what might have been an emerging economy that suddenly is experiencing tremendous growth um, in a way that it maybe hadn't before? And that doesn't just tell us where the money is going. It also tells us something about the future of potential social unrest, markets that are ready to be made, um, areas that are ripe for innovation, you know, et cetera. Um, thank you. And, and since we started um, with one of the items on the list that might not feel as immediately relevant to every organization or every mm -hmm. company, um, I, I do want to kind of put a put an exclam exclamation point or a punctuation point on something you said earlier. Um, all 11 of these sources are relevant to everybody, right? It's That's just right. a question of being able to connect the dots between mm -hmm. this trend and its potential impact on your business. That's right. And so again, you know, companies tend to focus on threats that are familiar, opportunities that feel immediate and familiar because they've already got the systems in place to monitor and to measure all of those risks or to deal with um, opportunities. But this tends to create a brittle situation where uh, organizations aren't prepared for things that they didn't feel like they could see coming. And that leads to uh, you know, leaders having to make uh, quick decisions under duress. So the trick here is, yes, you gotta measure what you can measure and focus on what you normally focus on, but you have to do that while looking at the interconnectedness of a bunch of different things. I realize we have several thousand people on this call, but Paul, can I show you? Can I show you a visual real quick? Absolutely. So I'm in a I'm in my home office. Everybody who's watching, don't judge. Uh, I'm going to spin around and show you one of the outputs of the ten sources of change. So that's George Michael hanging on my wall. All right. So what you should be seeing on your screen for those of you watching looks like a maybe like an NCIS crime map. Uh, but but in practice, what this is, is me trying to articulate and figure out how the future of artificial intelligence intersects with um, how we live our everyday life. And so what you can see is some of those sources of change. So I've got geopolitics as a central node, uh, and I've, I've got some other sort of key things. But I'm also looking at biotechnology and censorship and off-planet exploration. And it's the relationships Again, I'm sort of forcing myself to look at the future through many different lenses, through all these different areas of change. And the output of that tells me, gives me this sort of huge map of in information, this constellation that helps me frame my understanding of what the future is looking like. I'm going to spin this back around. Thank you. Sure. Um, More information than anybody needed? No, no, actually, great. Really. Cool. Love these. Um, love these bonus visual aids. Let's um. <laughs> let let's work. Let's uh. Let's get back to the list and work our way through. And the second one is certainly germane to our conversation this morning. Mm -hmm. Um. And you know. Um. I'd love to kind of dig in just a few minutes, and that's education. And I wonder if you yeah. can talk about why this is. Um you know, a source that we need to be monitoring in all times, and then maybe mm -hmm. some thoughts on the particular challenges of the moment. Yeah, so that's, I think that's a great place to stop. So um, again, if we're looking at this, uh, you know, thinking about the future, um, and we're trying to hunt down where are their signals, where are their trends, how do we start formulating our understanding of the future? You have to do that rooted in data. So this is not about speculation. Um, so the question would be, what do the data tell us about the probable and plausible future of education and the entire educational ecosystem? I think a lot of people's gut tells them right now that kids will be learning at home, like this will have forever changed how kids learn. And as a futurist, the question that I always come back to is, what would it take for X to be Y? So if it's the case that we've got all these kids all around the world right now learning from home, 
Um, what would it take for this to continue in the future? So here is where, rather than speculating, it's super useful and helpful to think through these other language, uh, these other lenses. So infrastructure is a lens. Do we have the technological infrastructure to support not just, you know, in big cities in the United States, but elsewhere in the US and certainly around the world, distance learning. I think some of the technical hurdles we're currently facing doing this seminar uh, might prove out the fact that we're probably not there yet uh, from, a, from bandwidth um, to having uh, access to the right technology and not to mention how people you know, interact with each other. If we think in terms of government and governing, you know. I can't think of many school systems or universities that had data governance policies thought out in advance of this pandemic. So not only did they did not have a state of readiness plan in place um, in the event that there was going to be a prolonged distance learning event, you know, we're, we're, there's all kinds of data floating around. Um, there's the data that's obvious, this video transmission, but there's also sort of the invisible ambient data uh, so I don't mean to freak everybody out, but if you've got children and they're learning um, and they're learning on an online platform, there's a tremendous amount of ambient data that's also uh, capable of being scraped and recorded, mined, refined, learned from, that ranges from what's visually in the scene to all of the hums and creaks uh, and other noises being made within your home. That all falls within data governance, and I can assure you that most you know, places didn't have that figure it out. Anyhow, I could go through every single part of, of these uh, you know, sources of disruption and talk through the future of education. My point in doing a little bit of this is I think we have to get away from speculating in abstraction about the future of work or the future of education um, because in practice, there are a lot of other components that ought to be considered, uh, such as, you know, if distance learning ha is what happens in the fall uh, for whatever reason, um, what are the next order effects of that? And one next order effect is that, you know, a whole bunch of kids may decide they don't want to go back to, to school in a distance learning format um, and that they'd rather take a gap year. Another way to think about this, so that's a business case. Another way to think about it is, what impact does this coronavirus have on the workforce 20 years from now? The reason I ask that question, and it's an education question and a technology question. And the reason is because there's all this longitudinal data that tells us that um, early childhood education is paramount in this, the longer term success of a person. So if we have a prolonged school outage as we are basically having right now. Um, I know a month doesn't seem like a lot as an adult, but in early childhood development, that's actually quite a bit of time. How does that play out over a very long period of time? And even a better question is, how does that create a strategic vulnerability in the country where you're living? I can tell you that in the United States, um, this is this problem that we have with the virus, which is currently a public health problem, is an education problem that we may not see the, the true negative effects of for another 15 to 20 years. But if we know that that's a plausible risk factor, that's what we got to start mitigating today quickly. So that's a huge issue, right? And 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 of course, all the 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 um, the sources you identify are in their own way um, huge and complicated issues. But as as education as we know it maybe fundamentally changing before our eyes, that makes our ability to monitor it, kind of coming back to the organizational mandate to be staying on top of these trends, it's seemingly impossible. So how do you begin to wrap your head around even what to look for mm -hmm. um, with respect to education and where it's moving? Sure, so I'm a big believer in data and framework. So I am a quantitative futurist and most of what I do is uh, use data uh, for many different sources. I model that data using frameworks. A lot of times we're using qualitative data. We get quantitative when we can um, and try to understand next order impacts. Um, you know, in my world, uh, longitudinal trends are more important than what's trendy. So again, I would just urge anybody thinking about the future of X, right? Uh, whether that is the, how people will work, how people will learn, um, 
how people will move around. Another big question is whether or not uh, we will suddenly change our approach to, in, to climate change, because we now have all of this data showing um, the immediate impacts of like not driving as much and not having our factories run as much. So again, all of these changes that feel sort of hyper, uh, you know, real and specific um, in the present do not necessarily portend what the future will look like. So again, what would it take for X to be Y? Um, and the ways in which we are learning right now, um, I don't think are sustainable given what we know to be true today. There's not, and so going back to wealth distribution, there's plenty of communities in the United States, elsewhere in the world that can't get online. Um, you know, and children who don't have access to basic technology. So sustaining this over a long period is going to be rough. The federal government in the United States was not ready. I mean, they obviously weren't ready for the pandemic, but they actually weren't ready to work uh, during a time of pandemic. And to some extent, that's because for the past few years, there's been less of an insistence on uh, creating a state of, state of readiness for remote work. So, you know, what does that mean in the in the farther future? It probably means that just about every industry will uh, be more adaptable to telework going forward. Uh, but it certainly doesn't mean that this, you know, what we're experiencing in the present is the new normal. Can I just pause on the new normal piece for a moment? Because that's probably the biggest question I'm getting asked right now. Mm -hmm. um, everybody wants to know when will things go back to normal and what is when will the new normal set in? Um, so again, as a few, and I get asked those questions because I'm a futurist and everybody wants to just, for me to tell them the future. I'm not an oracle, right? I don't know what the future is going to be, um, but I'm curious about that question because every strategy officer in every big company that I talk to is asking it right now. I think we're asking the question about normal because it's, Really, what the question is, when will things stop changing so quickly? Yeah. When will we have less uncertainty? And the answer to that question, of course, is, I don't know, you know. Um, so so what I would say right now is, don't chase the answer. Um, instead, lean into uncertainty, but do it using, you know, methods and frameworks, because right now, what we should all be doing is making incremental decisions in response to what we see happening, but with an eye on the farther future. Yeah, that's a really interesting um, point. And, and in fact, it's one of the things that that we at Sloan Management Review as an editorial organization have been talking about, kind of, kind of more overtly thinking along multiple time dimensions, mm -hmm. what we're going to publish in the next two weeks, the next two months, the next six months, um, which perhaps we always did, but we never did it quite so formally. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a, that's a, just a really interesting observation. So we're going to get back to the list, everybody. And I'm also going to post all 11 in the chat so you'll all have it. Um, but, you, you know, you said something interesting um, a few minutes ago. Well, everything you've said is interesting, Amy. But there, there's something that kind of stuck <laughs> with me. And, yeah. and that is, um, you know, could we, should we have been prepared for the jolt to remote work or at least been more well prepared than we mm -hmm. were? You know, I think there's going to be a, obviously a lot of Monday mon Monday morning uh, quarterbacking uh, if sports ever starts happening again. And you know, once once we're out of this, everybody's going to have an opinion. Um, I, I think that there are, you know, I don't think that every single business should have had a, you know, pandemic preparedness kit sort of ready to go. Um, I, you know, there are potentially an infinite number of disruptors. That being said, um, every organization should constantly be thinking near and long-term simultaneously. And if something works in the near term, um, you should be asking yourself, am I in control of all of the variables that would enable whatever's working for us today to continue working for us in the future? And I'll give you a example that everybody will understand. Um, and that is the supply chain. So if you're a company and you're sourcing part of whatever it is that you make from just one place, um, you are probably feeling uh, not so great right now. Um, and, you know, 
over the past maybe three decades, efficiency has driven. And I think there was this great, I saw a great post about efficiency on uh, SMR that went through the social media feeds today. But efficiency has become prior, speed and efficiency are prioritized um, over longer term thinking. And one of the things that I think this pandemic has proven out is the brittleness of today's global supply chain. Um, so, you know, I would not, I would not have expected like a, a global, you know, heavy manufacturing conglomerate, for example, to have predicted COVID-19. That being said, um, if you're not actively producing scenarios, not because like your, your C-suite demands it, but because it's, it's, um, it's a sign of sort of a healthy organization. If you're not producing scenarios that are constantly pressure testing what you do today and whether or not that still works in the future, you know, you have problems. Every organization, everyone that has a strategic plan um, now has a strategic plan that no longer makes sense. So it does, you know, given what we're in and the crushing amount of uncertainty, now is not the time to throw up in your, your hands and say, well, we'll just wait. We'll wait for all the disruption to end and then we'll plan things out. Um, right now, you have to use these 11 uh, macro sources of disruption. You have to look for data. You have to think things through and you have to start developing hybrid scenarios. So these are scenarios that describe near-term survivability and long-term growth. Most companies don't do that anyways, um, but now especially is the time to be doing that. You know, one of the, one, you know, an observation, um, I think it's really interesting <clears throat> that this huge disruption that we are experiencing right now actually explains or gives very specific context to most of the 11 sources you cite. And I'm gonna use that as a lever to start moving us through mm -hmm. some of them. But the, the third thing you list is infrastructure and boy, are we experiencing um, how yeah. infrastructure can disrupt our world um, and the need to understand, right? The broader infrastructures in which we're operating. Yeah, and so this is one of those categories, like I know you say infrastructure and some people gloss over, but here's why it's important because I'm not just talking about bridges and roads. So when we when we are looking at, when we're using this framework, um, the way that I use infrastructure is much more broad. So I'm th yes, obviously I'm thinking about, you, you would sort of put automation in there and you would be thinking about global supply chain routes, but it's important to connect, again, like just as I'm asking you not to look at your industry through a very narrow lens, um, this, framework is magical when you connect different parts of it uh, together. So for example, if we think about infrastructure and geopolitics and the global pandemic, um, that would lead me to China's Belt and Road Initiative, which is a sort of huge uh, economic initiative intended to spur growth and activity uh, in emerging markets. But it's not just about building physical infrastructure. I mean, it is for a lot of debt. Um, it's also about laying uh, surveillance infrastructure. And some of it is not necessarily nefarious. Uh, if you wanna maintain a global supply chain in parts of Africa where nobody's gone um, with commercial businesses before, you, you're gonna need the internet, right? And you're gonna need wireless capabilities. That being said, uh, in what ways has this global pandemic started to shift, either accelerate or decelerate um, investment throughout Latin America and Africa, what do, where does that put China? And given where a lot of Western economies have gone over the past 36 months, which is to say more closed off, a little bit more isolationist, does the pandemic start to reshape the global economy, not just because business is bad, but because literally we are drawing new lines between allies, um, supply chain routes, you know, new types of laws, et cetera, how does that start to look? And if, and and then most importantly, where does your company fit in the middle of all of this? So if you're a CPG, uh, if you're, uh, you know, a furniture manufacturer, you know, you need to be thinking very, very critically about this and really thinking about the future, you know, connecting geopolitics, infrastructure, uh, the global pandemic back to your company. and again, see, seeing how those connections play out over time. 
Great, thank you. So I want to get to some um, some of the great questions that are coming from our audience, which means we're not going to be able to go one by one through the remaining seven. Folks, I did post the entire list um, in the chat, and we'll also put a link to Amy's article where she does get into each one of these in more detail. Having said that, um, there's one that uh, one of the remaining um, um, items on the list does kind of stand out, I think, as less intuitive. Um, or less even explained or elucidated by the current situation we're in, and that's media and telecommunications. Will, will you spend a minute um, on that and the need to monitor um, that item? Sure. Um, so I would say that there are two factors that anchor every single business, and those are technology and then media and telecommunications. Um, you know, even the most secretive, close knit companies still require information channels in some way or another, um, either to tell others about what you're doing or um, to learn from others what can be done, right, or, or whatever. Um, and it's the case that our media and telecommunications channels are no longer as restrictive as they used to be. They've become democratized, which means that um, sometimes a silly meme that you may not be participating in, that may not make any sense, TikTok, right? Which I think people kind of sort of understand as a place to share silly, you know, silly vi videos. Um, uh, what happens in these places has reverberating effects. It starts to shape public consciousness. It, have, it sometimes eventually rises to the level of regulation. And so every company really does need to be aware of how information spreads, um, how to validate that information, and also within this bucket, how information is starting to shift and change. We are on the cusp of something called synthetic media and synthetic content, which would take me longer to explain than the time that we have left. So suffice it to say, this is using generative techniques and existing data to create not just deep fakes that I think everybody's now sort of aware of, but the the sort of next generations of that, um, which include fully generated people, voices. Uh, your previous speaker was talking a little bit about digital twins, simulated environments. There are business value um, operations. There are ways to grow your organization to do some testing. This is also a security risk uh, because somebody could impersonate you know, your CSO, your CEO, modulate their voice and and not just for satire, but to embezzle money in ways that you've never thought through before. So every single business has to think through, um, again, given what we see today, uh, what is the link to media and telecommunications? What is the link to technology? And ultimately, how does all of that, uh, how, how do all of those factors over which no one entity has all of the control impact my business? So I want to squeeze in two uh, two final questions. So hopefully there's a relatively short answer to the first one. Are okay. all of these sources of potential disruption created equal, or is it important to act like they are? Because we're, a lot of organizations are going to be inclined to obsess about number yeah. seven, public health yeah. going forward, yeah. and maybe leave some of the other ones less tended to. Yeah, I would say that there is no one of these that is more important than the others. But as you start to use this framework, I would encourage you to start with one of the areas that is least that feels least connected to your industry. Um, because again, the point of this is to reveal uh, areas that you weren't paying attention to, to reveal early risks, to see potential opportunities, to find signals, to use this in conjunction with another framework to spot trends, all of this is to broaden your perspectives to see around corners. So start with the one that feels the least connected and know that all of them are you know, equally important. Thank you. So I think a lot of people in our audience today may feel as though their organizations are awfully exposed, right? Hearing you describe these many sources and particularly given the exposure we're all experiencing at the moment. Mm -hmm. Can you leave us with a silver lining? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, you know, I would consider myself to be a pragmatist, and I believe that we still have agency in building the world 
um, as it becomes. So with that being said, we are not helpless in this situation which feels entirely beyond our grasp. Um, and we should not feel crushed by the amount of uncertainty that we are all dealing with. Everybody is going through crises all day long. Um, so the challenge that I would leave you with is not to just like get through it, but to figure out how to thrive, right? Um, in the wake of adversity, where can you project out uh, possible solutions, possible opportunities? We are living through a moment in time that's a little bit like driving a car on slippery ice. Um, if you slam down the brake and just try to stop what's happening or, or just go back to the way things were, you're going to crash. However, if you lean in to the, to the slip, which feels wrong, uh, and you keep your eye on the road ahead while making tiny little adjustments, you're going to get out of this okay. Uh, and, and that's, to me, hope, right? Because it could be that on the other side of what, you know, this, this horrific thing that we're all living through, we, we will have built a better world. Um, and so that's what I would leave you with. And I believe everybody has the power to do that. You just have to make a decision that that's, that's the choice that you want. Fantastic. Amy Webb, thank you so much. This was a great conversation. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. We are joined now, I'm pleased to be joined by Max Wessel, who is Chief Innovation Officer at SAP and happens to be a former favorite student of Clayton Christensen. They worked together on, on many projects over the years, but I'm delighted to have Max bringing us his own views and perspective on the mighty topic of ethics in technology innovation. Max, welcome to our symposium. Thanks, Karen. It's a delight to be here virtually. Virtually, exactly, and as all things must be these days. So it's Indeed. a it's a weighty weighty topic, uh, and your article uh, addressed it before we even knew we were in a time of kind of a morass of ethics. I'm going to say, but let's talk about tell the audience a little bit about the core concept at play in your article. Absolutely, I would say that the the article itself started off that it's important to understand the genesis. The core concept started when. I observed with my co-author, Nicole Helmer, that uh, in the Bay Area, at a minimum, there were cars zipping down the street that effectively were driving themselves. And there was a great deal of caution as that technology was rolled out as to how we dealt with some of the uh, more moral issues associated with these multi-ton vehicles barreling down the road. And the fact that there was all of this impending crisis uh, that was physical, it was real, it was visceral. You walk across the street and you actually care how a, a autonomous vehicle is taking a decision, whether to stop, veer off in another direction or not. We, we were juxtaposing that level of caution to what was occurring in many different industries where we were seeing a decomposition of what I would say um, or characterize as moral obligation or ethical obligation and instead we, what we'd seen emerging was effectively sort of moral or regulatory apathy uh, innovation for innovation's sake that was coming to decompose a given business to topple to disrupt to do whatever it is to recreate the world in a vision that is uh, simpler cheaper more accessible but without necessarily regard for some of the the, the ethical conundrums that we find ourselves in. And so a couple of years ago, we started thinking about um, what was the source of change that was occurring across, across the, the sort of global economic environment? What was the driving factor and what were the risks that emerged? And we saw one trend come again and again, which was the internet gave way to increasing modularity in our value chains. Uh, years ago, Clay spent a lot of time writing about the theory of interdependence and modularity as I will characterize very simply when something is a difficult technical challenge we tend to approach it with an interdependent design we tightly control all of the components of a given system to ensure that we can deliver the utmost performance the example here that's a classic is the iPhone when we had the emergence of the smartphone tightly controlling the components that were used in a given system, 
the screen to the chips to the hardware case and microphone, even what you saw with the early antenna design, sometimes that led to poor call quality, et cetera. That interdependent architecture was critical to deliver performance. But as connections are standardized, it becomes a lot easier to break apart systems. And what we saw in the last two decades with the proliferation of the internet was that the, st the connections were standardized across a variety of, of industries, whether it was firing off a standard CAD file to go to a 3D printing shop somewhere in the world to print an industrial grade component, whether it was figuring out how to incorporate financial documentation to provide lending or underwriting services, whether it was as simple as making an algorithmic bid on an advertisement, whether it was through Google or through Facebook, et cetera. So the internet gave way to an immense amount of standardization that allowed value chains to be broken apart faster than we'd ever seen them before. And what we saw is a, a great deal of opportunity for innovation. It's as a user, when you have a plethora of, of choice, you get exactly what you want. But the problem that we saw in the core of the article is that as users choose, they choose for themselves. They don't take into account some of the societal negative externalities, the costs, the burdens that we put on people. And we saw increasing examples of the, the number of times companies were bringing users the choice they want at the expense of, of uh, the societal kind of need. And in fact, we saw this in a, a juxtaposition of short-term desires versus long-term benefit to users. Because users tend, you know, we're very, everyone who's paying attention in this symposium is cognitively biased. And we tend to reward ourselves in the short term at the expense of some of our long-term needs. And so what we, we realized through this exploration and the heart of the article is what you can do as an organization to put yourself in the role of standard bearer to instead of imagining just what you can do to break apart the value chain and enable that choice, how do you protect yourself against some of the costs you may impose on people in the future? So Max, let me break down some of what you just talked about just to, to make sure the audience is following with us here. So the, the original example you gave, which was the one that kind of spurred your thinking was the um, automated car, automated uh, car, um, mm -hmm. driverless cars. So what you're talking about is uh, the, the creators of, uh, of automated cars, driverless cars, have to pro make programming choices, right? In this situation, do I try to save the driver or do I try to save the pedestrian? They have to, make, they have to imagine every scenario and make moral value judgments about choice A, choice A, choice B, choice C of what will happen in a certain scenario. Is that what you're talking about for that, uh, the, the producer of that car gets to make that choice? Is that what you were referring to? Yeah, that is what I'm referring to. And also the fact that because it's driving is such a visceral experience and it is so regulated and we understand the cost so directly that we are thoughtful about it right now. Whereas right. if you right. take another example that we, we put on the table in, in the, the course of the article was 3D printing with home consumer grade 3D printers, where when we brought things like MakerBot to the market, we were targeting, frankly, uh, a market that was underserved, that was not well understood. It turns out that the, the MakerBot that we brought to bear was also perfectly capable of printing a 3D gun. Didn't work all the time, but we hadn't, unlike with the automotive industry where we would had been very thoughtful about how we prepare for that future, in a lot of other industries where we see the value chain break apart and power to make decisions put in hands of new constituents, we hadn't been thoughtful about what those changes would require. So why is this a seemingly an increasing problem right now? Why are we thinking about this now more than ever? Is it the speed of innovation? Is it the speed of things going from interdependent to modular? What's making this so relevant right now? If you look at the connectedness of our world, which will only grow with the introduction of technologies like 5G coming and making networking, speed of communication even more uh, prolific. If you look at the embrace of open source 
innovation to drive standards into communities and power into the hands of innovators, you are seeing a compounding uh, speed of innovation, a compounding speed of modularity being brought to different industries. So I think it is an increasingly important topic, but it is also one where we, you know, I think it is increasingly important because we often as a society value the, the short-term gain, even in the way we talk about innovation, uh, relative to the impending cost. And I'll give you a very specific example that's in the news right now. But we have Google and Apple partnering around an API to do tracing and tracking of individuals. And by the way, for in the COVID crisis, it's a, it's a great response right, that we have two technology giants that own operating systems coming forward and thinking about how they could expose this data. But absolutely, before we put those APIs into work, we need to think about the privacy implications. What happens when you open this Pandora's box? And that's where we cannot separate technology innovation from ethical and moral considerations. Well, let me be devil's advocate for a moment. You know, why? Why why should I care about it? I'm providing a product or a service that people need. I can do it in a modular way. I've helped somebody do something, right? In this case, I've helped uh, potentially save lives by playing a role in, in contact tracing. What, why do I, as the company, have that moral or ethical responsibility? I'm part of a much bigger universe. Why am I supposed to be taking the lead on this? There is There is real business risk to absolving yourself of responsibility in an ongoing basis. Because the, the risk in the long term is that you become regulated or frankly, consumers lose trust in you entirely. Uh, there are lots of companies that have enabled, for instance, um, algorithmic underwriting of individuals uh, that have broken apart the insurance or financial system stack and made it easier for people to get access to credit or payments. If you happen to be the company that has made it easier to generate subprime mortgages and you've just provided the algorithm and people have put it into use in many, many uh, abhorrent ways and that causes a financial crisis, nobody really cares what your terms and conditions say. And, and that's where I think business leaders fall into this short-term trap of if, if you believe in anomalous events, it actually matters how you behave in the long term and how you put yourself in a position to protect yourself over the long term. In the article, we mentioned the example of Anne Wojcicki at 23andMe. And 23andMe got into, uh, was, was the first genetic testing company to see kind of increased FDA um, attention around its treatment of data and how it provides recommendations to its um, users. What I would say with 23andMe is the fact that they had been very, very proactive around this topic, building an advisory board that counseled them on how they use in the same way an academic institution, how they would have the, counseled them on how they should and could use the data that was within their systems, made it much easier to deal with a regulatory authority and to justify to their consumers that they were acting in a in a beneficial way both from a societal perspective and for their end users and i think that that confidence that precaution that has lent itself to a longer term success than they could have sustained without that that sort of ethical lens in place does that disrupt the speed of innovation? I and mean, are there consequences for companies who might want to do it, but we need to get to market faster or we can't wait for all of this to become apparent? Is, is there a negative that comes with taking that kind of personal responsibility as a company? There is a negative and there's an opportunity. Every headwind is also a tailwind. I would say that in an era where we think about privacy more and the importance of uh, journalistic integrity, the folks who were, you know, that the folks who were at the forefront of figuring out how to bring high quality content um, with integrity to the market in a digital environment benefited in the wake of um, many of the scandals surrounding, for instance, Cambridge Analytica and Facebook. And so if you believe that in the long term, this is sort of the, 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 Benjamin, the Benjamin Graham statement, in the long term, the market is a, is a weighing machine, in the short term, it's a voting machine, 
Um, in the long term, if we think these ethical issues will come to light, you have an advantage by being a company that is taking a, a position, then the right position in the market. And I would say Apple, did, Apple has benefited from this in the last few years in an enormous way. They've been investing in privacy protecting technology for their users when it comes to tracking storage of information, uh, consumption of content. And you know what you saw is potentially for three to five years, their, their transition to cloud services was slowed relative to some of their competition. But in the wake of many of the scandals that emerged, they became their users' uh, best defender. And people started to respect and reward them for that. That's a very good point, actually, because that is clearly their brand at this point, and that's probably even more valuable now than it would have been five years ago for them. Um, is it is it ever too late? Can you can you make if your if your company has not taken this initiative, has not sort of tried to shape the conversation about uh, the ethics of of technology in your area? Can you become a leader after the fact? Can you organize with other industry leaders? What what can you do if you haven't had the forethought to do this? I think it is more of a question of varying degrees of difficulty. Obviously, if you have legacy and you've made investments in things that are potentially questionable on the long term in terms of how you have leaned in or, or avoided certain kind of moral issues, it becomes more challenging, but it's never too late. If you imagine yourself as the standard bearer and you adapt to that world, it is possible to make change. And I would argue if you look at if you look at the way, for instance, Uber has changed under Dara and the way they have thought much more holistically about their role in the ecosystem, um, how they can support their drivers, how they should enable choice, the, the types of things they bring to the table, you know, that change arguably happened far too late in their process of maturation, but it happened. Um, and that change was necessary. Had they not done it, you would have seen far, far more backlash from their user base. Right, that is, that's a great example actually, because I think they could have tumbled really from, from their lack of doing mm -hmm. that and, and catching up quickly now, probably as part of an important survival strategy. Speaking of survival, let me ask you this, Max. Uh, how does this play out in the current COVID crisis? It, it may sound like nice to do, nice to have, nice mm -hmm. things if business were normal, if life were normal, but right now we're trying to keep the world you know, connected and alive. Um, how, do, how, does this, how does this play out and how important is it now when we're in this extraordinary circumstance? I'll say two things, and this is where I get to put on my hat of my, my day job to some extent, which is managing 5,000 people at an organization that is going through much of this change at the moment, and dealing with this in an ongoing basis. And I'll say the same thing that I say to them, which is, yes, this time is challenging, but the world will continue to turn, the sun will continue to rise, and we will certainly have an economy that will be reshaped through this crisis, but we will have it in two years and three years and four years and five years. And so we, we need to keep in perspective that our principles matter now as much as they'll matter in the future. And in fact, you know, it's when things are challenging, when we have to defend those, those core beliefs around uh, human behavior and our respect for consumers, our, our uh, you know, advocacy against exploitation, all of those things are more critical now than they will be in the future because it's easier to fall victim today under pressure to the desire for quick and simple solutions. And it's often very difficult to roll back uh, against the cost. And we talk about surveillance as, as a big issue. And I'm glad that there are still people who are out there um, doing advocacy on behalf of personal privacy, that we're thinking about things like um, how we use, use the current crisis to reform our economy in appreciation of, for instance, uh, employees who shouldn't have a lack of labor protections in many situations that they're experiencing right now. And so I think I would argue it is harder today, but more important that we keep these topics central as we think about what our response is and how we build the economy we aspire to live in over the next two to three years. 
does this need to be a collaboration with government and regulation in some way, or is this important to be ahead of that uh, coming coming along? The pace of innovation is outpacing our ability to regulate preemptively. And the pace of innovation is outpacing government so much that where there was limited risk on waiting for government before because the experiments would be small, now you have an experiment that is successful that turns into a global phenomenon in a matter of days or weeks. And I think the that change took us from a posture of being able to wait on government to reach out to us to one where we have to be proactively engaged and we need to be thinking about the institutions that we should we should work with um i'll mention i i uh, a, a, a section mate of mine from business school started a company called everly well and um, she was the first the first at-home lab testing company to secure a COVID test. Um, and to her credit, proactively worked with the FDA to ensure, to figure out how these should be rolled out. And instead of releasing them to consumers as the rest of her business um, operated, she figured out a way to distribute them to healthcare workers at the front line. If she weren't proactively working with regulatory institutions around this, because she knew this was the right type of issue to address, um, she would have taken a different decision. And arguably, she could have taken a different decision that would have put the business at risk. So I would say for anybody who's driving innovation, you shouldn't allow this to slow you down indefinitely, but you should absolutely be proactive, seeking opinion, understanding the regulatory environment, partnering with government and public institutions, and doing so for the best in interest of, you know, of society, of your consumers, of your end customers. So Max, you mentioned the, the founder of, of, of the company. Um, whose job is it to be uh, aware of thinking of ahead of all of the ethical issues that could be coming down the line with innovation? Is it at the top leadership of the company? Is it in the innovation team? Who, who is supposed to be monitoring and thinking about this before it becomes an issue? If I return to the, the example and it's it's not an insider view but but more of the pop culture view of uber i would say it's impossible to have a ethical or moral standing on how a company should operate if it's not pervasive across the company i don't think there is a person at apple that doesn't understand apple's policy on privacy and who owns the data that their devices generate um, because decisions are amplified all over. Now, that does not absolve us, and this is where I'll, I all respect to Professor Porter, I would say, that does not absolve the CEO from being anything other than the most, like the most important strategic stakeholder. And so with Julia at Everlywell, I think it was critically important that she were involved, but I think you have to have a culture where those questions are escalated and that it is okay to talk about those issues in, in on a long-term basis where people understand your risks, your principle, and your perspective. So what kinds of people would be on an advisory board for a company? Just give me a range of the types of external perspectives that would be helpful. Uh, members of NGOs, academics, uh, experienced leaders from industry. I really depends on the type of uh, issue you're dealing with. So for us, we have a lot of focus on AI and data privacy. So we have experts in machine learning and um, sec security and analytics, these types of issues, because we're trying to attack one of the core issues that face what we believe to be our industry. Now, if you were in healthcare, you would have a very different set of external stakeholders dealing with some of the, the issues that you could imagine face you. In the article, we talk about imagining you become the standard bearer as a disruptor or an innovator inside of a large organization. And I think what you really need to do is say, imagine you become the standard bearer and imagine the, the perspectives that society would require of you in, in that environment. It's easy for the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal to understand who plays a role in their ecosystem because they've been doing it for 75 years. Um, for the Facebooks of the world that are building the next generation of media empire, 
when you're on your upward trajectory, it would help to think about, okay, what were the types of perspectives that came in to advise the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and how do we build an advisory board that gets us some of that insight without necessarily being the subject of regulatory scrutiny right now or existing processes? I think that's one of the most important points for a private sector audience is get ahead of the regulatory scrutiny. You know, be, be the standard bearer and, and you'll watch that you shape how things are judged and valued and viewed in terms of ethics. Uh, and I think that's almost one of the biggest ROI um, arguments of, of your piece, which is you don't want to wait for it mm -hmm. to be imposed upon you. You want to lead it. Uh, and when you're in the position of leading, that's the strongest ROI I think you can imagine for yourself. It allows you to chart your own course. Exactly. And that is a much better position to be in. So any parting thoughts for our audience in this era that might feel very Wild Westy right now of survival and quick solutions and just good enough and elbowing each other out of the way for market share? Any, any uh, pearls of wisdom to make sure people don't lose sight of how important this is? Um, only that we will, people will have a long memory about the good that we do and the corners we cut um, through this process. And so I think the, the good news for all of the folks in the audience, whether it's from the private sector or the public sector, is people are interested in helping and we're all looking for solutions and creativity should abound in our new world. So just be conscious of the way in which you deploy that creativity. Thanks, Max. I think it's a really important article. I'm so happy that you wrote it, and I think it's more important than ever right now because it would be very easy for that to get swept aside in this era. And I think, as you say, people have a very long memory, and I think it's, I recommend the article to all of our listeners. Thank you so much for joining us today, and uh, I'm going to hand you back over to, to Paul Michaelman. Thanks, Max. Take care. All right. Bye. And I am happy to bring in uh, Rita McGrath. Hi. Hi, Rita. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, audience, I think most of you are probably already familiar with Rita. She doesn't need an introduction, but she's going to get one anyway. Um, Rita's professor of uh, professor at Columbia Business School, and she's the author of uh, several books, including *The End of Competitive Advantage* and *Seeing Around Corners*. Um, so once again, thank you, Rita. Um, and in the next 30 minutes, we are going to, or we're going to ask you to help us understand the new breed of disruptors, which was the topic um, you covered in your recent Sloan Management Review piece. So Rita, who are the new disruptors and what do they suggest about the classic theory of disruption? Well, in the classic theory of disruption, you had um, a new entrant that wasn't very good, um, and but appealed to a niche market, as I think Scott and um, uh, Michael were kicking us off with, it seems pretty recently ago. Um, but the idea was that it appealed to a different market segment than would be the customers for an established institution. And the argument that I make in the article is that the new disruptors um, are actually offering products and services in a very different digitally enabled way, but they're just as good in many dimensions as the offering created by the incumbent. So from a customer point of view, these are alternative offerings right out of the gate. So the new disruptors can actually create services or offerings that are every bit as, as good as what the existing incumbents do. Uh, they just do it in a digitally enabled, uh, very cost effective way. Well, so let's dig into some of the characteristics um, of this new breed um, and discuss why legacy methods to address disruptive com competitors might no longer be adequate. Well, I think part of what you see is these customers and companies are really leveraging digital technology. So before I get into that, maybe it's worth spending just a minute on an idea that um, my colleague Ryan McManus um, originally developed, which is that if you think about how digital has come into our lives, it has a very particular path that it's followed, right? So digital in a business sense really first started to be a mainstream issue in what was easy to digitize. So books, movies, uh, later on video, communications. And if you go back in time to the early days when digital, I put it in 
we pin it to the, about the mid nineties and everybody had to have a website, right? And everybody had to have a, a browser and it was the browser wars, remember those times? But digital people sort of looked at it and they went, oh, that's cute, it belongs in marketing, right? And so digital was often just thought of as a marketing thing. Then we moved into a new era where digital started to become infused into products. So if you think about a service like eBay, um, for example, um, and you know, we started to have two-way communications. One of your earlier panelists alluded to that, where you know your communication was no longer corporate out; it was anybody could be part of the conversation. So you can't buy a hammer on Amazon without running across some comment that says, "Oh, I left it out in the sun, and the plastic handle melted, and you know, a hammer." <laughs> so we're starting to have products that are digitally infused, digitally informed. And where we are sort of recently and now is we're starting to see digital influences in our business models. And so things become possible that never were possible before. And the economics really change. So if I were to take just an example of YouTube, right? I mean, when YouTube was first commercialized, corporate titans did not sit in their headquarters terrified at the thought of what this destabilizing technology was going to do to the future of media empires and information sharing and trustworthy television or any of that. No, I mean, what did people think of when they thought of YouTube first time out? Cat videos, right? <laughs> that's what YouTube was. And, um, um, and to a large extent, that's still one of the uses of YouTube. But if you think about it, um, what YouTube and other enabling technologies have done is they've made it possible to do at a scale uh, and at a low cost nest, if, if that's, that's even a word, at a scale and uh, at an eco economics that are radically different from what incumbents can do. So if I wanted to get um, a, a video message to 100 million people, and I wanted to do that 20 years ago, I would have had to be a major global media company. Today, literally two kids in a garage can do something silly on their cell phones. And as Amy said, it becomes a global meet. Um, and so I think that radically changes what's possible. So if I go back to your original question now about why incumbents struggle so much, I don't think it's a question of technology or money or talent. Um, I think it's a question of um, looking at the world through a lens that's informed by what used to work. And if you're looking at the world that way, it's very hard to get that alternative perspective uh, of what could be changing that you're not even paying attention to. The, the lens of what used to work, though, is a perpetual, perennial challenge for leaders. What's different about it now? Why is that more urgent? Or is it? Well, I think each generation has this clock speed of what it works on, right? So um, I think for any of us sort of got used to the way we do things in the pre-internet era. I mean, I remember when I was a, a doctoral student, I remember literally taking a, a, an entry to a um, academic conference uh, and my husband and I were literally in the car driving to New York City from Princeton, New Jersey, where we were living at the time, uh, because that was when the last FedEx delivery would leave to be the last physical submission, you know, to the last time I could get into the conference. And it has a happy ending because the conference won a, a, um, a paper, it won a best paper award, which was awesome. But, you know, if you cast your mind back to that, think about what made that necessary, right? Well, we didn't have the speed of communication. We didn't have the digitization of everything. We didn't have the, the taken for grantedness that I should be able to zap a PDF to anybody anywhere in the world, like within the next 10 minutes. So I think speed has been um, a big part of it. I think the increased ubiquity of these kinds of infrastructures. Um, I mean, if you go back to, again, go back to the 90s, uh, how did we even get on the internet, right? Was, remember AOL, right? All those, those disks that came to you in the mail. Um, and um, um, you know, we kind of forget that, that this infrastructure has all been built up around us. And so it's, it's really speed, it's ubiquity, it's the interconnectedness of things, as a couple of your panelists have referred to. Um, we, we make a lot of individual decisions without understanding how they connect to a bigger system. And I think that's one of the challenges people have. So when you're looking at your piece of a little system, it's very easy to overlook the problems or challenges or risks that can come up from um, another piece of it. So just as another example, Amazon Web Services, which is really 
the modern day equivalent of the old time sharing business, right? People forget that was a business model that existed once where you shared expensive computer time. But what Amazon's services have done is to effectively democratize just about everything. So I don't have to buy servers or hire programmers or do any of that stuff until I absolutely have to. So the speed, the ease of entry, the dropping of entry barriers, I mean, all those things I think are part of this mix. So as we as we look at the characteristics of the digital economy, as you as you clearly articulated, it, it this is going to be a terribly simplistic or, or 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 perhaps obvious question. But why have these trends, these characteristics, access, speed, ubiquity, become such a problem for legacy companies who were used to competing on a different playing field? Um, I just think it changes the rules, right? So if you think about how you got where you are, right, uh, in any business, there were a set of rules that you learned and honed and your craft became important over many years. And when the rules change, first of all, you may not have the capability. And I think Scott Anthony referred to that this morning, which is, um, you know, you, you you can't just wake up one morning and decide you're going to be an Olympic athlete, right? You need to you need to practice, you need to train, and I think a lot of these legacy companies are still working with a different regime. You know, they're still optimizing a different uh, path to commercialization. So I think that's one big problem. Um, the other thing I would say is some of the smarter companies in SAP, I would say, is in that category who you just heard from. Uh, but some of the smarter companies are not sitting around waiting. Um, we've talked about Adobe today. Uh, I think Adobe's really done a great job of maintaining its innovative edge. And uh, it's not that old a company. Um, you know, you've certainly seen disasters, but you've also seen companies that are really getting it. Um, Nike would be an interesting example to me of, of using these new disruptive technologies to go direct to consumer, which they will tell you now is their, their that's the, the, the lead of their strategy. They're, they're calling it the um, direct to consumer assault, I think, or something like that. Um, but I mean, there's a very established, very successful company, which used to sell to 40,000 retailers. And now they've announced that they're going to go down to about 40 that they care about. So not only are they changing their own business model, they're going to change the business model for every other entity that's ever made any money by carrying the Nike product. So are legacy companies that are able to compete effectively against, against this new breed of disruptors? You know, is there a certain DNA that needs to be present in these organizations? You cite Nike. Nike is known as an innovator almost throughout its entire existence. Yeah. Yep. I think that, um, yes, uh, so I, I, companies that do this well have a really great way of balancing their investments in what I'll call the core business, today's business, uh, with investments in sort of the next day core business, which you can think of as near field businesses, and also in options, taking out small options, which are experiments you make today in order to um, uh, buy you the right to make a future choice. Now, one thing I would add that is new in the last month <laughs> is we used to think of the core business as relatively safe, relatively stable. You kind of knew what was going to happen. Next year was going to be like last year. Well, everybody's core business has now been shoved into this high uncertainty space. And um, I thought Amy's observation about the new normal and uh, you know what we're really looking for is a return to certainty. Well, you know, I can't promise when that's going to happen. And so the good news here is we have a tremendous number of tools that we've developed over 30 years of studying innovation, or maybe even more of studying innovation, which I think now come into their own with this new, very disruptive environment, high uncertainty environment that we're in. So I talk a lot about uh, planning, but not planning to, you know, exercise some giant humongous plan, but planning to learn. So the idea is, you plan to the limit of what you know, then you stop and you say, well, wait a minute, what assumptions have I made? What must be true to get that outcome that I want to have happen? And then you take the next step. So just as an illustration, um, obviously at executive education at New York City, nobody's flying to New York to take executive education classes right now. So we're thinking about, well, could we repurpose some of our knowledge and understanding and create a virtual experience? Well, I could sit down and write out a you know, $200,000 proposal with all the detail and that, 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 and give it to my dean and see what he says. But you know, does that make any sense? No. So what I would rather do is say, okay, here's what I think the outcome could be. I think we could have a very robust, much more global 
offering, which would be more accessible to more people. So that's the good side. And here's what I think we might be able to charge for it. And here's what I think we might make on it. Then work backward into, well, what would have to be true? Well, the first thing that would have to be true is my organization would have to support this idea. <laughs> so the first thing I did was I wrote a note to our, our dean and I said, I've got this idea, what do you think? And he said, ah, worth pursuing. So the next step was to say, well, who else in the stakeholder community would have to be behind this? And obviously we'd have to have a client that, or two that would be willing uh, to possibly consider it. So the next step was a meeting with a client, run through the idea, get some feedback. What, what do you think about things like duration and how much content should there be and what would make it valuable to you? And then the next step at which we're at right now is putting together some kind of proposal so that we have something we can think about. So what I want to just sort of get people to understand is when you're in high uncertainty, having this big long range plan doesn't really make much sense. Now it makes sense to have a strategy and Scott and Michael talked about that earlier, which is you need to have directionally a point of view about where you want to go, but you want to learn your way to doing that rather than thinking that you know the answers. Um, one other thing I'll, I'll just mention because people are very fearful right now. And I think one of the things that people are fearful of, and this extends to innovation as well, is they're afraid of failing because we have this mindset that says, hey, if you try something and it doesn't work, oh my God, that's a failure. And we want to avoid that. Well, let me put it to you this way. In a high uncertainty situation, that's crazy thinking, right? You cannot predict what is going to happen right now. Even Amy, who's one of the world's greatest futurists ever, says she, even she can't predict. So if she can't predict, like the rest of us need to be very humble about that. And so think of it instead of, here's what I think I want to learn. Here's the time and effort it's going to take me to learn that answer is learning that answer. Now the answer could be yes or the answer could be no. Is it worth my taking that time and effort to learn that answer? Because if the answer to that that question is, it is worth it. And you develop a hypothesis which turns out not to be true, then, then you didn't fail. You know, it was just one more piece of evidence that you can use to say, okay, I made some progress in learning. So one practical thing that our listeners can do you know, starting this afternoon is start to write down what are your assumptions about what you think is going on with whatever important decision criteria you need to be thinking about right now and, and get yourself into a rhythm of when you hit a critical checkpoint, which is a moment that teaches you something. So the answer to the proposal was yes or no, the meeting with the client was positive or not, the technical test went well or not, then go back and double check that list. And just doing that will do two things. First of all, you're giving yourself permission to learn. You're not saying, this is my prediction, and if I'm wrong, I'm an idiot, right? What you're saying is, no, this is my best guess as to what I think is going on. What's your best guess? And you can then document your progress. And I think one of the things people find really hard under uncertainty is they don't get a sense they're making progress because they haven't hit the goal yet, right? But if you can see that you're making progress toward a goal, um, I think that's super, super helpful. So I'm going to put you in the position of being uh, armchair psychologist or maybe leadership coach for a minute. I'm going to I'm going to read some quotes to you, right? That were that that um that that were that were that were pulling in. Um, if you if you if you plan for what you know, well, based on what's happening now, I feel like I know nothing. Mm -hmm. How do you respond to that? Well, I think the first thing is, you know, give yourself permission to acknowledge that because none of us do. I mean, I don't know about your business, Paul, but <laughs> my, what I used to spend 80% of my time doing has kind of evaporated in the last in the last month. So we're all we're all kind of in that same boat together. So take a deep breath and give yourself permission to feel that way. Then I think the next thing to think about is what decisions should I be preparing myself uh, to make? So all of us have decisions about how we spend our time how we care for our families, how we think we might look towards some kind of employment, how we care with, how we deal with people who are depending on us, you know, whether they're employees or team members. So I would kind of maybe go through that, that list of critical decisions about what might I need to be doing next. Um, and then for each of those critical decisions, and I would keep it short, I wouldn't do more than maybe five, right? Um, what would have to be true for that decision to work out in a positive way? Um, then back into, okay, what are the assumptions that I'm making? So let, let's take some concrete examples relevant to COVID-19. Um, we could be looking at a future where you know, things go a lot better than they are or things go a lot worse than we are. But right now, I don't think we can predict that where we are with COVID today is where we're going to be even a month from now. 
So what could you start to put in place that would be helpful and beneficial you know, now, even if you're not quite sure where a month from now is going to take us? So just as an example, I, I've seen in my life um, just an explosion of alternative ways of connecting with people. I mean, <laughs> it's been every hour on webinars, phone meetings, you know, you name it, because people are trying to experiment to see if there's anything here that would be robust. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts, and I'm sure the audience would as well, on maybe some techniques, for lack of a better word, on how to kind of isolate on some opportunities amidst all of this noise, right? Um, where, do, where do you look for opportunity, or how do you evaluate opportunity in the kind of chaos that we're experiencing right now? Well, the, the cardinal rule here is going back to Clayton Christensen um, is what what is the job customers or potential customers are looking to get done? And several of your speakers have alluded to this. Um, any crisis produces a huge number of new jobs to be done. Um, and we're seeing just enormous creativity. There's a, a company that um, their business is making shutters, basically, and uh, nobody's buying shutters right now. Nobody's interested, but they've completely transformed their operations into making transporting and shields for medical operations. The entrepreneur that owns this business had 60 people. He was terrified he'd have to lay off. He's brought on another 150 because the scale of that has ramped up so much. So we're seeing a tremendous amount of, of creativity. Dyson, and I love this story. So Dyson decided five years ago to get into the electric car business. And at the time, now this is back to assumptions, right? At the time, the only legit competitor in that business was um, Tesla, and Tesla was a premium product. And so Dyson felt going in, Dyson the man, felt going in, wow, you know, if we can crack the code on really difficult technical challenges in electric cars, uh, that could be a very profitable plus, you know, environmentally sustainable, a lot of good reasons. So if you go through this assumptional list in 2015, uh, it, it made a lot of sense for what he proposed to do. Well, here we are now, uh, 2019 was when this decision was made. Um, and unfortunately for Dyson, VW and GM and all these other big, big manufacturers were going into the electric business. But here's the problem. They weren't prepared to charge the kind of premium that, that Dyson and Tesla were able to get. And so his fear, well, what, he, what he recognized after you know, a lot of effort in this, was that even if they succeeded technologically, the prices they would get for the cars would be pushed below um, profitable levels. And you know, he wasn't willing to take on the capital to fight that battle. Okay, so that was sort of late fall 2019. So here we are now, first quarter 2020, and what they've done at Dyson is they, they took in 10 days, they went from blank sheet of paper to working prototype of a new kind of ventilator. They've taken all those assets that were used for the car, transformed them like very quickly into ventilator production facilities and the National Health Service in the UK has placed an order for 10,000 of these things. So, you know, wonderful story that kind of takes you the whole arc from, oh my God, this business blew up in my face, my assumptions weren't borne out, very, very painful decision, you know, they'd made a big commitment to, hey, here's an opportunity, we can actually go in and uh, capitalize on it. So I know some of what I'm about to say is just language play, but but bear with me. Is competitive advantage really over? Because hearing you hearing you speak, it sounds like flexibility, dexterity, and resilience might be the new competitive advantage. Yeah. Well, for a person who wrote a book called The End of Competitive Advantage, I would be, you know, <laughs> it would be pretty silly of me to say that it wasn't over. Um, yeah. So think about the concept that the word competitive advantage implies. Um, it implies, first of all, that your main goal, your main job is to have something that's better than some competing organization that you can then preserve for a long time. There isn't a customer in there. There isn't a sense of what, what's the job or need you're trying to fulfill in there. So I've been looking for a better phrase, and, and so far I don't really have one, but I think the, the, the the focus that notion of hunting for competitive advantage creates may be misplaced. Um, so some, some more questions from our audience, and thank you to our audience for their generosity of questions. Um, Rita, what would you say is the biggest impediment to incumbent companies making the leap into new digital business models? Is it leadership? Um, is it operational? Um, you know, it's it's a combination of leadership and governance. 
Um, and and you know, as as I've said in in the article and in a couple of other publications, we have this mindset, I think, that when we see uh, an inflection point coming or when we see something that's a threat to our business, it, leadership should be you know up on a horse with a sword blazing and leading the way fearlessly. And my research suggests no, that, that and I'll go back to the Nike story, right? That Nike has been experimenting with direct to consumer easily since the late the mid to late 80s um, so what you want to be doing is making small investments that then accumulate to real capability so i think what holds organizations back is that they first of all they don't value those options on the future that are represented by these small investments and they don't really have a process for nurturing them um, and you can think of it as the innovation process but it's not just innovation it's any new capability to de development and what you need is you need the idea right and then you need some kind of incubation process where you nurture the idea to the point where it's ready to be brought into some kind of commercial use and then the hardest thing is you have to have a process for accelerating that idea so if it's a venture let's just say um you know in the early days you protect it from corporate and you try to keep it like on its own and you try to make sure it's it's happy and healthy in its own little sphere um as it begins to become mature and you're thinking of actually introducing it to real customers or real operations or put it into your supply chain well, Guess what? You have to open the door and embrace legal and compliance and quality and all those other things. So you have to go from having an idea, testing out the idea and incubating it to accelerating the idea so that it can become part of your actual ongoing operation. So I would say probably the biggest impediment is companies insisting on big bets, companies insisting on ROI in you know, very uncertain circumstances, those kinds of policies which actually truncate their ability to develop and nurture these options. Great. Uh, another audience question. How can you create a culture that fosters internal disruptors? Or maybe even can you create it, such a culture? Or does it have to be kind of there from the beginning? Well, I think you can create such a culture. And when you look at turnarounds, um, definitely you can you can see that happen. Um, I think a couple of prerequisites, and it this one really does begin at the top. And, and I'll start with um, a question my buddy Alexander Osterwalder always teases me about. It's literally what is on your senior leadership team's agenda. And I mean that incredibly literally. How are you spending your time? If you're spending your time on sending the message that it's all about operations and it's all about this quarter and keep the wheels on the bus going, your people are not stupid. They will pick up that that's what's important to you. If you're spending 30 to 40 percent of your time on what's our future, you know, what's the growth prospect? You could call it innovation, but you could call it kind of how are we going to chart the path forward? That's what people will be spending time on. So that I think is the first prerequisite. Second prerequisite is a concept Amy Edmondson you know, discovered years ago, which is people need to have psychological safety to introduce uh, disruptive ideas, to introduce something flies in the face of today's orthodoxy, if you will. And again, if you're the kind of leader that's like, don't bring me a problem without bringing me a solution, well, that's not going to encourage much in the way of disruption. So I think this connected kind of openness to ideas, questioning, being curious, you know, how could this, being willing to ask the question, how how might this be disrupted? How could we conceive of that? And then And then nurturing the people that can do that. I think those are all important qualities. Great. So amidst all of this change, both the change you identified um, in your article and then the change we are experiencing now, what hasn't changed? Oh, I think there's a lot that hasn't changed. Um, and this is, a, I'll call on Jeff Bezos, who talks about what's the foundation for his strategy. And he said, you know, I cannot imagine a planet in which any customer says, Jeff, I absolutely love Amazon, but I wish you'd sell me more expensive products and ship them to me more slowly. <laughs> you know, I just can't conceive of that. So I think the jobs that we have, to go back to the jobs to be done terminology, they don't really change, but how those jobs get met are are very changeable. So what won't change, you know, we're going to want some notion of stability and security again so that we can invest for the future. We know that we're going to need some way of building skill and, and, and teaching people new skills to cope with whatever this future has to come. Um, we know that we're probably going to want to continue to support our families and our communities. I think there's a number of things that that, that won't change. You know, it's interesting the Bezos quote, right? I, I think that there actually are many of us who are choosing um, or accepting getting our goods more slowly, exactly. yeah. um, because we're we're one, it's just the reality, but two, in you know, um, it's a nod towards the greater good. Um, so, 
you know, on, on that note, perhaps a, a final thought or two on not letting this huge disruption we are all experiencing go to waste. Thank you. Um, well, I believe I've been calling it the great unfreezing, which is, as you said, if you'd asked me, if you'd asked any of us six months ago to put all this investment into remote capability and learning to do all these things, we all would have said, yeah, yeah, we'll get to that. It wouldn't have been a priority. Well, now everybody's made that investment. And a lot of our assumptions are really up for grabs. Um, the one I'm particularly um, supportive of is really rethinking our social contract and how we allocate resources in a society. And we're seeing right now that you know our social contracts badly out of whack. So I think the opportunity to really rethink things like worker protections, healthcare, um, and where markets fail is a huge opportunity for all of us. Great. Rhea McGrath, thank you so much. This was a terrific half hour, and I really appreciate your time. Thanks, Paul. A pleasure. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you. So we are moving into our um, final session of the day. Um, and I think this is gonna be a special and interesting, really um, hopefully uplifting way for us to finish off. And for this session, um, first we are bringing back Karen, this time in the role of a panelist. And we are also being joined by Ifosa Ajomo. Um, welcome to you both or welcome back and welcome. Thank you. Um, hi, hi, it's good to be here. Thanks well, a lot. Um, thank you. Um, and, you know, we are, um, we're going to talk, well, first of all, if, if Osa, I, I think I need to give you an introduction. Karen is well introduced by now. If, if Osa leads global prosperity research efforts at the Christensen Institute, and is the co-author, along with Karen um, and uh, Clay, of The Prosperity Paradox, How Innovation Can Lift Nations Out of Poverty. Um, and I, I'd like to, um, I frankly, I'd like to sit back and just listen to the two of you talk to each other, but I will maintain my role as moderator for the, for the next half an hour. But perhaps um, for those who are not familiar um, with, with the work, what is The Prosperity Paradox? Yeah, thanks a lot, Paul. Um, <clears throat> You know, The Prosperity Paradox was the uh, uh, last book our dearly beloved Clayton Christensen wrote. Um, and it really describes a process that helps us understand why investments to eradicate and poverty um, often don't work. Um, a lot of times they might even exacerbate the problem. Um, and I'll explain it by telling a short story. Um, yeah, in, in, in 2000, I, I moved I moved to the U.S. for college. Um, I'd been here eight years. I left Nigeria. Um, but 08, I started reading books about development, economics, and poverty, and it gripped me like nothing had ever gripped me before. Um, and so I started a nonprofit organization, started going home every year, um, raised money, and we started building wells. Um, but many of those wells broke. Um, and that process of identifying a problem um, flooding a community with resources uh, to solve that problem uh, really helped us understand the prosperity paradox. It's this incessant focus on trying to end poverty as if that would create prosperity, trying to improve indicators. Uh, we build schools, we build hospitals, we build wells, but we don't really understand the mechanism that helps keep those resources sustainable. Um, and we try to explain that in the book and try to explain the critical role that innovation uh, plays in, in helping uh, nations prosper. How has, uh, uh, thank you, that was a, was a great, it was a great beginning. So I, I, um, I'm not sure, um, I'm not sure when we kind of start the clock, but perhaps it's the kind of identify, identifying this idea and publishing the book. I'm interested in the reaction. I'm interested in kind of how progress has been so far. Yeah, I mean, um, the, the reaction has been um, overwhelming. Um, it's been more positive than, uh, than I thought it would be, quite frankly, um, but it's been overwhelmingly good. Um, you know, since we published the book a little over a year ago, 
Um, Karen and I have had the opportunity to present uh, some of this work at the Aspen Ideas Festival. Uh, we've written several articles for many different publications. Uh, we've given a TED talk that's you know reaching two million views now, um, and we're in um, direct conversations with um, a couple of development agencies and foundations on rethinking how they focus on helping people uh, get out of poverty. Um, you know, the, 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 the focus right now is really on providing resources uh, for poor communities. Um, in fact, there was, a, there was a New York Times article uh, that came out, I think it was yesterday, that said something like, um, you know, 10 African countries have no ventilators at all. Um, and many others have a handful. Um, you can imagine the visceral reaction for that would be, oh, we got to go and provide ventilators. We got to go and, you know, provide these resources. Similar to how I reacted with, we got to go build these wells. But if you take a step back and begin to understand the process and the mechanism by which a society can develop ventilators, can maintain them, can insert them into a business model that makes it sustainable, it fundamentally changes the questions you asked, uh, which was something that our, you know, Clay, Clay really imprinted in our, in our minds. So where is the early traction strongest? Um, is it NGOs, governments? Is it, is it the private sector? So I, I'm interested in yeah. kind of the, the, what this journey is looking like. Yeah, it's, um, it's been, it's been the private sector, but interestingly, it's been, uh, a specific group in the private sector. It's been the emerging entrepreneurs and the emerging sort of venture capitalists who, um, you know, we, we should have been able to predict this, but it's the, it's the low end really of this community, the guys who are identifying opportunity where many bigger organizations only see uh, poverty, but they identify this opportunity and they say, we've given them a language. We've given them a process, a way to think about this opportunity and to make the case that, um, that you know, when you look at emerging economies, it's not just all about you know, the poverty demographics. Um, and so VC uh, funds that look at emerging markets, um, innovation hubs uh, in, in emerging markets, um, and some foundations who are very focused on entrepreneurship as the lever um, to create prosperity. Well, this comes back really nicely to what Scott Anthony mentioned in the first session of the day, that history has shown us that even in the most dire circumstances, innovation continues and, and, and the seeds of things that become really important uh, happen when it seems like it's the least possible time for strong innovation. So one of the really, I think, lovely and hopeful messages of the book is that the book talks about the idea of what we call market creating innovations, innovations that literally create a market where there was none. So it, it, it created opportunity and revenue from where no one thought there was any possibility at all. And that happens in some of the most unlikely places, some of the most impoverished countries in the world, where you see the seeds of things take, take root and then really begin to grow. So it's a very positive message about what history tells us, not just our theory. It's what history tells us is possible, even in what seems to be the most dire market conditions. You create your own, create your own market. And that's the opportunity that we're hoping people will see in this book and these ideas. Yeah, if I could... So in Please. Sorry, if I could just interject and, and expound on that a bit, you know, um, you know, in, in the 1980s, just to show you the power of market creating innovations, um, um, AT&T um, actually contracted with a, a consulting firm and said, you know, can you estimate for us how many um, cell phones there'll be in by the year 2000? Um, uh, consulting firm said, you know, about uh, a million, uh, 900,000. AT&T was like, it's too expensive. We're not going to go ahead and invest. Well, it turns out um, at the time in the U.S., there were about 109 million phones in use. Globally, there were about a billion phones in use. And so that ability to be able to target what we call non-consumption, understand what the barriers are, um, and then create a new market is absolutely critical um, for organizational growth and prosperity as well for a region. 
Thank you. Um, so in implicit in this idea um, is that governments aren't solving enough problems on their own and that entrepreneurship and innovation need to step up and play a more aggressive role. Um, has there been any resentment from government um, to this idea? No, you know, um, not not really. I think what we try to do, and again, I know to Clay here is, um, he said, when you introduce language that helps people understand circumstances a lot better, then you can make progress. You know, what we've tried um, to make people see is, um, it's not so much that governments aren't doing enough. When you look at many governments in emerging economies, and you just look at how much money they have, um, in terms of their budgets and divide that by how many people live in these countries, what you get is um, they cannot, no matter how much willpower they had, they could not solve many of these problems. So to give you an example, the average um, African country uh, government spends roughly uh, $290 a year per citizen. Well, in the US, we're pushing about $20,000. In Sweden, it's about $30,000. And so when you begin to see many of these indices that compare oh, corruption in a rich country versus poor or um, governance and many of the education, um, what those indices fail to, to um, take into consideration is where are these governments starting? And the other thing that we tried to, to do in the book is say, you know, let's go back to the US when, when we were poor. Let's go back to Europe when we were poor. What did our governance look like? What did expenditures look like? What did this social contract look like? And it looked very different. Um, and so in a way, we're not excusing governments, but we're saying, let's understand why um, a lot of struggle in governance happens and how we can, um, we can help them improve tax revenues and improve uh, their, their own uh, abilities. Does success in this effort require cooperative government? I mean, you're you're certainly we're, we're, you're certainly going to come up upon or entrepreneurs, depending on where they're going to come come upon governments that are cooperative and even cheerleading, and, yeah. and those who are not. So, um, you know, help us think about that a bit. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the way I would answer that is say success um, will be accelerated by a cooperative government mm -hmm. um when i when, when you know when, when when the word requires comes into play then the the implicit assumption is uh, so therefore if the governments are not uh, interested then you, it can't work but you know there are many poor countries um where you have market creating innovators i mean when you look at the mobile tele, tele uh, telecommunications revolution across virtually every uh, um, poor country uh, today, uh, you know, it wasn't like they had these supportive governments and entrepreneurial environments, um, some more than others. Uh, but what you now have is virtually every poor country has a thriving mobile telecommunications sector. Um, and so the amount of struggle that the entrepreneur has to go through is more when you don't have a supportive government. But what we try to explain is you know, the expectation right now um, when you are looking at doing innovation and entrepreneurship in a low income country is not for the government to endow upon you a ton of resources. Um, it's really to figure out how to navigate, um, you know, some of the um, some of the minds uh, that, 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 the, that the governments um, would, would set. Um, and it's understanding why those things uh, are, are happening. Um, Supportive government accelerates, um, but I, I wouldn't say it's a, a requirement. Paul, in almost all the cases that we chronicle in the book, uh, government, it's a matter of sequencing, really. Uh, government can come in after and support. But what's so extraordinary about these examples of successful market-creating innovations it, are of the number of hurdles that the entrepreneurs and innovators find ways to work around, literally creating their own infrastructure, creating their own health care, creating their own logistics. They, when they can create those things because it becomes integrated into their business model and then that is successful, government often follows behind and supports and, and finds some way, but, but 
it's almost like the most extreme beta test and they succeed. They, they are able to do it and they create something that becomes a real market and it's all woven into their business model, making it viable for the long term. So what, what if anything is the opportunity or responsibility um, of Western industry and particularly mature industry um, to help encourage um, innovation as a solution? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the, the first thing that the Western industry and, you know, companies, corporations can do is, um, you know, to go back and look at where they started. Um, many successful Western uh, uh, um, companies today started at, at a time when uh, there was vast what we call uh, non-consumption, right? The inability for folks to consume products and services, even though they would they would benefit from them, um, and there wasn't really this enabling uh, enabling environment. Um, and so to go back and sort of understand that that's a similar environment many um, middle to low income countries um, uh, find themselves in today. Um, and then the second is uh, to look at that non-consumption, not simply as, um, as, or not only as just, you know, that's a sign of poverty, but to look at it as an opportunity. That if I go in and create a new market um, in this uh, economy, like many others have in my country, like many others are doing in, um, in these, these regions, that could yield significant returns for my organization and have the added benefit. Um, I think this is where uh, we just got very excited about the work. Have the added benefit of lifting so many people out of poverty. You know, when, when you think about the impact of COVID-19 right now, um, you know, all of us can shelter in place, right? I've got a refrigerator, electricity, I can buy a lot of things. But even the idea of sheltering in place for billions of people in our world is impossible. They, they cannot literally shelter in place. Um, and, and so the, 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 the idea that you as a corporation can be a part of lifting this many people out of poverty is, um, is something that should motivate, um, but you're doing it not really out of charity or solely out of charity. You will be able to create a profitable uh, business out of this. One thing I would point out from a Western perspective when you're talking about developing economies is what is not successful typically is sort of importing the best of what's working in America or in Europe to a new market and, you know, making it a little cheaper, a little whatever. What we see being very successful are identify a Western company, for example, could identify struggles and real opportunities in developing economies. But what's essential is to start it in context of the environment that you're thinking of building or growing or developing developing it in. So the business model being fit into that context is essential. And that's where success comes. It doesn't come from kind of making a lesser version of what's worked elsewhere. It's thinking of it holistically in terms of the struggle of your non-consumers, hopefully your future consumers. Um, thank you. Um, so let's segue off of that. Are there, as we think about the wealth of problems, um, facing the world and its people um, that entrepreneurship could address or at least help address. Are there categories of problems business, business should not try to solve? Hmm. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I think, you know, things like defense, um, national security, <laughs> I think the government should, should, should take care of that. Um, but quite frankly, most other things, um, you know, businesses um, or a really innovation and the principles of innovation where you go in and you really, you take a, a ton of like some resources, you apply it to a problem and you try to create value so that the value extracted is more than the resources that you put into it. The principle of doing that time and time again um, should be applied to to virtually every um, every problem. And 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 if we go back in time, I think why why we loved uh, working on this book so much and the ideas is, you know, there are many um, government um, centric 
uh, problems we, 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 we talk about today, uh, many infrastructures um, that seem to be, that that's just the role of the government, that's the government's job. But if we go back and look at how these infrastructures uh, began, you know, why did we have railroads? Um, why did we have regular roads? Why did we have the, the telegraph? We look into the history of the development of some of these infrastructures that are now government focused. What we'll find is it stemmed from an innovator looking at uh, distributing or storing value, his or her innovation, more efficiently. And so they developed the infrastructure. As the infrastructure became more widespread, then it became, oh, the government has to manage that for you know, national security, security reasons and so on and so forth. And so what we found is that idea that this is the role of the government um, has been adopted by many uh, you know, middle to low income countries uh, without that history, without that evolution. And so you have governments really trying to build as many schools as possible, trying to build as many hospitals, trying to build as many roads. But like I said earlier, when you're working with $300 per citizen per year, it's practically impossible. Um, and so there are very few industries where I would say the, the you know, the it, it's the entire role of the government. I, I think the government, um, it can adopt these innovation principles uh, to help to help them sort of build them out um, and work with the private sector. But I, I, I you know, I'm I'm hard pressed to think of of too many, um, quite frankly. You you began to answer um, the question that I was that I was going to ask as a follow up. So I'm gonna, I'm going to ask it and let you give a more full answer. Is innovation really the domain of the private sector? I mean, should should can can government really? innovate the way the way we're talking about it here i I, th I think so i mean you know we 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 label things um you know there's a part of the book we do we, we discuss how our brains work um and how we put things in categories because it helps us understand the world a lot better um so you know what is the government i mean the government is simply a group of people who have come together and are following a set of rules and principles that define how they should operate um, and they do that for the benefit of the many. Um, there is nothing in that description that says you can't innovate. And in fact, there's a, there's a good book called How China Escaped the Poverty Trap um, that I think is brilliant because that book um, introduces us to ways that the Chinese government uh, built incentives into the system that promoted uh, innovation. Um, and, and so, you know, no organization is perfect. I mean, there are problems with the private sector, problems with the public sector and the incentives in these organizations. But I don't think innovation is a, um, it, it, it's, I don't think innovation is an activity uh, that should be limited to just the private sector. I think the government can innovate, but it would require them taking a step back um, and looking at, you know, in, in our research, what we call the, the capabilities, their resources, processes, and their priorities. And once you redefine those, um, you're going to be able to, I think, innovate to solve these um, challenges. I mean, the Singaporean government uh, innovates. Uh, the Rwandan government um, is, is, is a poor country, but it's nimble and figuring out ways to innovate to solve problems. And so I think governments can innovate. It's just that oftentimes we're shackled by, you know, what we believe the role of the government is, uh, which tends to be, uh, you know, slow bureaucracy. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't think it's too much of a stretch, although it's perhaps a slight generalization, that where entrepreneurship to solve big, hairy problems is most needed are also environments where education um, is at its poorest. So mm. where is where is this next generation of entrepreneurs going to receive its training such such that training is required? Yeah, um, that's that's an that's an excellent question because um, you know even though we look at the growth in in um, at least attendance, school attendance in many low and middle income countries, what we find is many, many kids are not learning. Uh, we write about this in the book and you can look at many UN statistics. Um, so kids go to school and they sit, but they're not learning. Um, so that's a big problem. I think when we begin to tie 
education um, to the, you know, we've heard this ter terminology multiple times today, to the job to be done. Um, begin to understand or ask ourselves the question, what is the, the purpose of education in this context? Is it to simply teach kids to write and read um, and they go out and they can't find employment, they can't um, continue their, their education, whether you go from primary to secondary to university and so on? Um, or is the purpose of education um, to diffuse knowledge in such a way that individuals can be more productive in their societies? Uh, we have to redefine what education is and what it means. And when we do that, I think there are opportunities to educate the masses in many low and middle income countries, even though there may not be resources for the government to do it. Um, that's one. The second thing I think is, as we look at um, uh, today's, many of today's rich countries, um, um, what we find is, as they were beginning to sort of prosper, um, there was a lot of borrowing that happened. Um, some stole, but there was a lot of borrowing. And so you had uh, uh, um, Americans who borrowed technology um, and know-how from the Europeans. Um, um, you had the Japanese who borrowed from the Americans and the Koreans who borrowed from the Japanese. And you borrow in different ways, whether you borrow through foreign direct investment or whether you borrow uh, by sending your citizens to go to school, uh, to learn in other countries and then come back and localize and implement. Um, I think there are different ways to borrow know-how um, from other countries. Um, so I think you know those two things connecting education to what is the purpose what's the job to be done and um and figuring out a mechanism for borrowing uh, from other countries uh, would be the way to go thank you can I, just, um, can I just add one more tie in Paul, to an earlier question? What, yeah. what Afosa was sort of referencing is, is really a great example of what Michael Horn was talking about earlier in education disrupted. What, what we think and we see is that the educated workforce of the future may well come from corporate needs requiring certain things, certain kinds of training, certain kinds of skills. And so they'll be directed in some way by those needs. They'll, we say the language we use in the book is pulled. It will be, education will be pulled to meet the needs of innovators and entrepreneurs rather than having a flooded market full of uh, educators. So Michael was connecting this really nicely to what we're going to see in the future. Uh, thank you. Um, and speaking of connection, um, you know, I, I think that that um, um, we may come out of um, this, the pandemic, um, which is a shared experience that we are having globally, although um, I'm not, it, 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 I'm not sure if it's a shared experience or a concurrent experience, because mm -hmm. I think every, 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 every country and, and, and even within countries, we're not having the experience yeah. equally, but we are all experiencing a truly global event. Is there, you know, is there, is there a positive perspective outcome that comes out of that? I mean, I think as we've heard earlier, perhaps major change, right, can only really take hold coming out of a time of disruption? And is there reason for optimism with respect to um, solving the prosperity paradox coming out of this very um, uh, incredible time? Absolutely, Paul. I think that's, that's a brilliant question. And that is what I want um, us to focus on now. I can't do anything about the pandemic. I mean, I, I you know, I got to stay home, um, but the pandemic is here and it's going to have lasting impact. The question now is, um, what can we learn from this and what positives can we take away? Um, well, I'll, I'll give two. Um, there's really nothing new under the sun. When we go back and we look at what happened uh, as a result of World War II um, after it, we, we made some big, bold uh, pushes throughout the world. The, the, the United Nations, the World Bank, the IMF, I mean, those are big institutions now, regardless of where you sit on their impact. We said, this is what we need as a world to stick together. But when we look at the emergence of Japan, and how that country invested in different disruptive innovations, we see similar things. South Korea after the Korean War. I think this is our opportunity to look at how we operate right now in terms of solving poverty and saying we need big, bold, and literally disruptive innovations. Um, that's 
that that's really my uh, my big I guess I would say big takeaway uh, from this pandemic. I was looking. If I was at Thank you very much. This has been a great half an hour. I wish we had more time to explore this. Karen, I'd like to give you the opportunity for some closing thoughts on this panel and, and, and the whole day. I, I think it's been a terrific day. I, I think it's really lovely and fitting that we closed with the FOSA because this was Clay's last book, his last work. And I think in some ways he cared about it as much or maybe even more than The Innovator's Dilemma, which is his most famous one, because Clay loved the idea of taking theories and thinking about how to solve the world's problems. And I think this one really is important. And, and we, you know, we're trying to, to sort of spread the word about the, the theories and the ideas because we think they become really useful tools to solving the world's problems. And boy, do we have problems. So Clay would have been thrilled with the day. He's thrilled with the people who uh, were in the issue, which he knew about and participated in himself. So thank you for giving his ideas a, a kind of window to the next 20 years. I think that's terrific. Well, and thank you. Thank you for all the work you did and putting together this wonderful special issue and for making today such an interesting and we hope successful um, and enjoyable event. And so that brings us to the end of our program today, everybody. We hope you've enjoyed it um, as much as we have. I want to thank you to our audience. Um, we were a big crowd and many of you made it all the way through. So Thank you. I want to thank all of our speakers, every one of whom was absolutely terrific. And I want to thank our sponsors, Get Abstract and MIT Sloan Executive Education. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day and stay safe, everyone.